If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Additionally, if you would like to request novels and access my Google Drive where I have 200 plus audiobooks, then you can join my Patreon, link is also provided in the description. Chapter 101, The Chamber of Secrets I stand up as I slide the diary into my pouch thank you, Ginny. I'll be sure to throw a few good words about you to Harry. She doesn't look to be in the mood to deal with my jokes so I step out the door waving as I leave. I sigh as I immediately head office to office handing in my homework to each teacher. Each of them has something nice to say except Snape of course. Flitwick was the most concerned with McGonagall coming in a close second. According to him, the dueling tournament has been postponed until further notice. But he said they will likely call it off to keep away from the drama. After that, I went back to the common room where everyone has already retreated after lunch. For the rest of the day, I just hang out with my friends and pretend nothing is different. It is nice being back. Once the night falls and everyone is asleep I make sure no one is awake and cover myself in my shroud. I quietly shift into my Dementor form and make my way out to the most private area on the grounds. The Forbidden Forest. I shift back to my human form as I reach a few hundred feet in and the terrain becomes indistinguishable from the rest. The book I read said Horcrux are no harder to destroy than the object they are made of. The caveat of that is Dark Wizards will stack charm upon charm, hex upon hex, to protect them at all costs. I sigh as I pull the diary from my pouch and hold it in front of me scanning it over with my eyes. If I didn't know this was a horcrux I would have never guessed it. I close my eyes and peer into the soul stored in the diary. It is slightly larger than a normal soul which means much like Dumbledore, Voldemort must have an incredibly powerful soul. I open my eyes again and open the book flipping through the pages I stop towards the middle as I see writing appear. Who are you? The letters write out in immaculate handwriting. I smirk a bit at his game can you hear me? Yes, the book replies. I am someone who has already k asterisk LLED you once now and plan to do it until you stay dead. Why? Because I can. Lord Voldemort. I say with a small grin. What do you want? The words spell out as expected. I toss the book on the ground as I point my wand at it configo. A large blast of flames hits the book but I can see it is unscathed once the dust clears. Sectum Semper I swing my wand like a sword putting a lot of magic behind my swing. The book is flung away and the ground is left with a gash a few inches deep. I sigh as I aim at it again drawing even more magic configo trio. Boom. The tree the diary is resting against is blown apart and the book flies into the air. My eyes narrow as I catch it and examine it again. It has a tiny mark of a small singe on the sides. It would take hundreds of spells to even burn a page. Fine, let's try this. I say to myself as I shift into my Dementor form. I hold the book only a foot in front of my face as I try to eat it. I can feel the soul is being sucked to me but has no path out of the book. I stop and open it wide and try again but nothing happens. Once I feel there is no point in trying to eat it anymore I grip both sides tightly. Gathering the shadows around my arms I begin to pull both sides with all the strength my skeletal arms and shadows can muster. The air around the book seems to be gathering magic protecting it. Seeing that the hexes are stronger than my physical strength I give up on that and shift back to my human form. You know I will destroy you eventually right? Why don't you tell me how? I say smiling at the book. I can give you the chamber. The book writes out quickly. My brows raise a bit interested and what would I want with an old decrepit chamber? It has the inheritance of Salazar Slytherin. And where is it? I ask actually a bit curious but I already have a good idea where. Below the school. Only I may access it. I shrug, sure, let's go on a small adventure. Perhaps the chamber will have something to destroy the Horcrux. I think to myself as I transform again covering myself in shadows. I make my way back to the school and head to the dungeons since it is the lowest part of the school. I transform back to human but keep my shadows around myself so I won't be seen. Where from here? The girls' bathroom on the second floor. In the darkness of my shadows, I stare at the book oddly. With a bit of hesitation, I make my way up the stairs to the second floor bathroom. Once I'm standing at it I open the book again. This is above the great hall, how could this lead to the chamber? I ask taking a few tentative steps inside. I stare at the ghost of Moaning Myrtle as I hear the book speak for a second time. Open. The young man's voice comes out of the book in a calm manner. The snake symbol above the tap begins to slither around the large circular sink as if it weren't made of metal. A small pillar behind each sink slowly raises once the snake passes them. 
Once the snake finishes a full lap around the sink it begins rising on the pillars revealing a gaping hole below the slab of granite. Moaning Myrtle on the side begins to cry as she hides in one of the stalls it's happening again. I hear her whimper. My eyes narrow as I look down the dark hole. Without hesitation, I jump down slowly falling over a hundred feet. I use my shadows to catch me when I reach the bottom. The walls are dark and the floor is uneven so I pull out my wand. I drop my invisibility as I hold my wand up. Lumos. Light radiates from my wand revealing that we are inside a cave lined with torches. I snap my fingers using a simple fire starter spell to ignite the torches. Once the way is lit I put away my wand and make my way forward. One way leads to a wall while the other leads to a large round door. The door has nine snakes on the center barring it from opening and one on the outer ring of the door. I use my shadows on my hand and try to phase through but hit a barrier. I pull my hand away as I hear the book speak again. Open the same voice comes from the book as before. Similar to the sink the snake along the outer ring slithers around the outside pushing the inner nine snakes out of the way. Each time a snake is pushed out of the way the door makes a loud mechanical sound. Honestly, I'm surprised this was made a thousand years ago. The door finally makes a small click and the large slab of stone swings open towards me. Behind the door is a massive chamber with waterfalls of sewage water and a stone pathway leading to a larger area. The center of the larger was filled by a massive stone head made to look like Salazar Slytherin. Chapter 102, Slightly Large Snake As I take my first step into the chamber on the stone path I hear a laugh come from the book. Come Basilisk, K asterisk LL this boy so I can be reborn. The book yells causing me to roll my eyes. From the corner of my eye, I can see the giant serpent coming out of the statue's head. You are really confident in your snake, I say to the book with a small laugh. I can feel his power try to manipulate my soul but I easily overpower it, try again when you are reborn. I look towards the door and speak in parcel tongue, close. I hear the snake getting close as the book speaks again you can speak parcel tongue? What are you doing? Shouldn't you be escaping? I speak as I begin shifting into Dementor form the snake should be running from me. As I reach max height I toss the book to the floor as I raise a wall of shadow in front of myself. Boom. ra The snake yelps as it recoils off the wall its fangs poking holes in the wall. It shakes its head as it begins to gather itself again. I raise an arm, gathering a tendril of shadow behind myself. With a wave, the tendril lashes out slamming into the basilisk. It isn't hurt a lot but is pushed into the water on the edges of the walkway. Once it disappears into the water I follow its soul as it swims under the platforms back towards the statue. A water snake. I joke to myself. My eyes look at the book on the floor before flying over it heading towards the statue. Past the statue, I see a secret room with a soul in it but I ignore it for now. I follow the soul of the basilisk as it begins nearing my platform again. It is incredibly easy to follow since it is the only small soul in the water. I don't think even fish want to swim in this water. I wait patiently as the snake circles below my feet. The snake stops in the area in front of the statue, slowly its head emerges from the water. It is very dramatic you would think eight more would pop up like a hydra. My eyes meet the snakes as I feel the magic radiating from its eyes. You will be a practice dummy. A test for me. The basilisk seems to understand me since it hisses at me. I flick my hand forward as two sharp tendrils of shadow launch from behind me. Rah. The snake flails as my tendrils pierce its eyes and it falls back into the water. I not seeing I successfully destroyed its eyes. I shift back into human form and close my eyes. I track its soul just as I did in Dementor form but this time I have my wand. I point my wand at the water where I see it Bobolias. White sparks of lightning leave my wand striking the water. I open my eyes to see the lightning is covering the water in white lightning. I'll be honest, I didn't know that's how it worked. I say aloud confused at why lightning doesn't break the surface tension of water. I shrug as I point my wand at the snake's new location. Bombarda Maxima. The water caves in making a tunnel as if hit by a missile and I can see a clear path to the basilisk for a split second before water caves back in on itself. I stare at the silhouette of the basilisk still swimming just fine with an annoyed gaze. How the hell do I hit this thing? I just wanted a fight. A light bulb ticks in my head. Water is weak to ice. Glacis trio a beam of ice spews from my wand covering the water instantly freezing it. I swing my wand around covering all the water in sight covering it all until I feel the water is solid all the way through. I put down my wand as I nod at my handiwork. I close my eyes and search for the soul of the basilisk and to my surprise, 
it's still alive beneath the ice. Configo duo. I say pointing at the snake under the ice. Boom. The ice is blown apart by a blast of fire revealing the blind head of the basilisk. It isn't moving and appears to be on its last leg. Bomarda I blow apart the rest of the ice covering the 30 foot long beast. Seeing I won't get the fight I wanted I shift back to my Dementor form. With a few tendrils of shadows, I grab the beast and hoist it up to the main platform near the statue. It doesn't resist but I can feel it try to squirm weakly. Don't feel special, I had to retrieve your body for your poison anyway. I may just save you if you serve me though. My dead voice echoes in its head. Its head turns towards me and hisses at me aggressively if I could I would smile so you can understand me. Too bad you have to die for the children's safety. I would have liked to keep you as a pet but you seem to be too stupid and too aggressive. I look back at the diary laying on the ground under a thin layer of ice. I wave a hand to the snake once again. A tendril of shadows pierces its throat just under its jaw causing it to gurgle blood as it slowly dies. I shift back to human form and pull out a file from my pouch. I slowly milk one of the fangs and walk back to the diary to test my theory. With a stomp, I shatter the ice covering the book. I slowly tilt the file dripping a few drops of poison onto its cover. The book begins to sizzle a bit and smoke rises from it. Ah! <laughs> Screaming comes from the book as a smile spreads on my face. I quickly plug up the file as I grab the book making sure not to touch the poison. Walking over to the basilisk I grab a fang from its massive head and yank with all my strength. It snaps off easier than expected. Wait, stop. The visage of a young man appears in front of me but is very faint. It is the soul of Tom Riddle. I just give him a wink as I toss the book on the ground and stab it with the basilisk fang. White light sprays around the room as I pierce the center of the book. I look up to see that the soul has been stabbed and is bleeding light in the same area I stabbed the book. Interesting. I raise the fang and stab again where his head would be. Sure enough, the soul falls to his knees as a hole of light opens in his forehead. I stab again in the area around where his heart would be. I grab the book and pull it through the fang stabbing it all the way through. I look up to see a glowing hole in his chest begin to expand. The visage opens his mouth like he is going to scream but nothing comes out. Only a few seconds later the soul disperses, having been destroyed. I stand up calmly but stop as I feel my hand is wet. I look down to see my hand is soaked in blood. I make a disgusted face as I try and flick it off. I wash the horcrux off in the somewhat clean sewer water and toss it in my pouch so I can research it later. I close my eyes and feel where the hidden room is. The entrance is the mouth of the statue but it closed when the snake came out. Open, I say in parcel tongue and the mouth slowly begins to open much to my relief. Time to get my loot, I say to myself as I hop over the gap into the mouth of the statue. Chapter 103, Inheritance of Slytherin as I step through the mouth of the snake the torches that line the walls begin to ignite. The room is fairly large with magical objects and books resting on stone selves around the room. The most eyes catching thing however is a large coffin resting in the center of the room. My eyes rest on the coffin wearily as I feel a bit of magic radiating off of it. I close my eyes to feel the souls around me and find myself nearly blind. I can't see anything outside the room but now I can see a tiny soul resting in the coffin. It is absent of any color unlike any other soul I've seen before. I slowly approach while keeping my wand ready. I rest my hand on the coffin and slowly push but the lid doesn't move. My eyes narrow as I push with both hands, I may be young but I am pretty damn strong for a kid. Seeing my attempts aren't working I take a step back. I point my wand at the coffin Alohomora I say as my wand flicks at the coffin. CCCRRRR. The stone coffin slides off a bit but not enough to reveal the inside, instead it shows how thick the walls of the coffin are. The stone top is four inches thick and the side walls are nearly half a foot thick. I take a breath as I use my shadow to slowly push the lid of the coffin off. Once it is halfway off I peer over to look inside the coffin. A gaunt corpse is inside with a thin layer of pale skin seemingly barely holding on. He is wearing pale green robes and a wand tightly between his hands on his chest. Each hand is adorned with a ring on every finger and thumb. My eyes narrow he looks familiar. My mind wanders as I try and remember where I've seen him before. Before I can remember I feel the wind around me begin to stir. We are underground, where the hell is the wind coming from? I mutter to myself. Looking around I notice that the wind is coming in from the door and circling around the corpse. My eyes lock on the corpse and observe for any movement. It has a soul so it can't be really dead right. 
My eyes widen as I watch the gaunt corpse's face become full and regain some color. The thin fingers begin to thicken as they twitch a bit. I let out a sigh, this will probably turn into a fight. I highly doubt any good-hearted wizard would be buried down here. With my luck, it could be Salazar Slytherin himself. I raise my wand again as the eyes of the corpse snap open who are you? Bang! The lid to the coffin that was still partially covering it shatters. The hand of the corpse grabs the side of the coffin as it slowly lifts itself into a sitting up position. I am greeted by a different face than what I saw earlier. The face is now more full but still skinny. The corpse now looks like an older man with a bald head and a long grey beard similar to Dumbledore. His eyes are unique, they are emerald green with his pupils slit like a snake. They have the signature shine behind them just like Dumbledore. The sign of a powerful wizard. You ask who I am. A dry and aged voice echoes from his mouth. The surprising part, aside from the corpse's ability to talk, was the thick Irish accent. I don't lower my wand earning a laugh from the ex-corpse, dust falls from his mouth as he does do you not recognize your ancestor. My brows raise as I tilt my head sorry, I dealt with that worm. I'm not related to you. His eyes narrow suspiciously as a hiss-like whisper leaves his lips do you not understand me. I do. I hiss back in Parcel Townge. To think that someone other than I, Salazar Slytherin, learned the secret to the language of serpents. He strokes his long beard pondering something. My eyes widen so you were Salazar Slytherin. A grin grows on his face so you know of me? What year is it? 1992, I say curtly not wanting him to mistake that I'm friendly with him. This time it's his turn to be surprised his emerald eyes widen as he turns to me. Could you repeat that boy? 1992. I say as if questioning myself. As the words leave my lips I feel a pressure similar to what I felt when searching Dumbledore's soul. I nearly fall to a knee as I feel the magical power radiate off of him. His snake eyes narrow as he slams his hand onto the stone coffin. Bang! The side of the coffin cracks and splits from where he hit it. Those incompetent fools! How many generations does IT take to produce a competent heir? My shadowy cloak covers me relieving the pressure from my soul I shrug this generation is actually quite powerful, easily the best since you. It is too bad he will die without a soul. His eyes narrow at me as I feel the pressure focus in on me you think now is the time to make a threat at my incompetent offspring. I scowl at his threatening words my next actions depend on your answer to my question. Do you plan to k asterisk lol the muggleborn? He smiles at me with no happiness behind his eyes no. I plan to butcher th. Before he can answer a tentacle of inky shadow shoots out from my cloak trying to pierce his skull. He flicks his wand using a protection spell to deflect it causing me to click my tongue. He slowly stands from the coffin as I watch him wearily that's a unique power you have there. Avada Kadavra a green light leaves his wand hitting my shadowy tentacle dispersing instantly. His eyes widen Gamin, how did you do that? I don't answer instead I summon five more shadowy tentacles that slowly sharpen into swords. Like extra limbs they swing at him like arms trying to grab him. With a casting speed I've never seen before he blocks all of them. A shield with a transparent sheen blocks them one by one the slowly forms a shell around him. He smirks as he points his wand at me but it quickly falls as he looks up at the ceiling as if looking through it. It appears the headmaster this year is quite the beast. I am still weak from waking up, so I will take my leave. I'll be back boy. My eyes narrow how does he plan to get out of the anti-apparition barrier? Seemingly answering my question he holds his hand out towards the locket sitting on one of the bookshelves. As if it has a mind of its own it flies off the shelf and lands in his open palm. The space around him shifts whirling him up till he disappears into a single point. A port key. Fuck. Why did he run? I look towards the ceiling where he looked before he left Dumbledore shouldn't be able to see past the chamber entrance in the bathroom, right? I ask myself. I wave my arm causing my shadows to consume all the magic items and books on the shelves. I'll inspect them later I nod to myself as I turn to walk out. As I step out of the mouth I lose my eyes and check for souls once again. I see Dumbledore in his office like usual with nothing out of the ordinary. I sigh that scared me, made me think Dumbledore might be able to see us. I quickly grab the destroyed horcrux and calmly walk back to the dorms. I may have made a new enemy today but what's new? I already have vampires and Voldemort to worry about, at this point Salazar Slytherin is just a showpiece. I downplay my thoughts to calm myself knowing full well it is a much bigger deal than I am making it. Chapter 104, Back So Soon
It has been over a week since I cleaned out the chambers and I have yet to hear anything about Salazar. I check the newspaper every day expecting to find something about it but it has been quiet. I received a letter from Dirk Garvey that my motion to sue the French ministry has been accepted. The letter said that he said the French ministry legally has three months to reply so it shouldn't be long now. I also took some time out of my day to go through all the things I got from the chamber. It was mostly just boring dark artifacts but one interesting thing I found is an egg. It is larger than both my fists and all black the egg has a small frog petrified to the top of it. I assume it is a ready-to-go basilisk ready to hatch. Maybe it will hatch if I unpetrify the frog? I push it off for later, although I like creatures a basilisk seems a bit dangerous to raise. The weeks go by quickly and class is overall fun. With Weasley wares becoming a thing pranks have begun to run rampant among the students. However, it has been deceptively lucrative, if they really do want to open a joke shop I don't mind funding it. I still don't know how they managed to smuggle so much contraband into the school but that's not my job. My job is to give them the money to buy supplies and we split the profit. I thought the rest of the year would go by smoothly, but I was wrong. Starting around Christmas weird things started happening, other than the fact that Harry, Ron and Hermione wanted to use Polyjuice to get into Slytherin's common room and investigate Malfoy. I don't understand how they think he could be the heir, he is kind of a loser. But the spiders in the school started fleeing into the forest. Things moved from where you left them and disappeared. For a magic school, you think weird things would be normal, but that's only if you mean for them to happen. I decided to stay over Christmas break like I told Auntie I would. I would feel bad if I were to ditch Ron and Harry again. Even Hermione ended up staying, Daphne, and Theo were basically forced to go home by their families though. Lucius apparently told Draco to try and get closer to me. I don't particularly mind, although I don't like his personality I don't think he is a bad kid, just misguided. Despite all the weird happenings around the school I never made anything of it until one night. Walking back from the dining hall later at night I once again hear whispers. My eyes snap to where I see movement. A small snake of a variety I've never seen before is slithering on the ground at the corner of the hall. I look around to make sure no others are in the hall. It's a good this I left the hall alone I think to myself as I grab the snake using my shadow. The whispering begins to sound like complaining as the snake slowly realizes it is being lifted into the air by my shadow. Its white head flicks to me as it meets my eyes, it obviously has intelligence behind its eyes. Release me you cur. The snake's tongue flicks out as it tries to lash out from my grip. I am a bit baffled as I stare at the snake in confusion before hissing back at it. Be mindful of your words little snake, they can get you in trouble. It is the snake's turn to be baffled as it looks taken aback and stares at me in silence. As if coming to a realization it begins to violently struggle to get free of my shadow's grasp. Too bad that won't happen. Release me, master warned of you. Its violent struggle slowly dies down as it begins to tire. And who is your master? I ask curiously. The snake stops struggling having given up and just stares at me do your worst. My eyes narrow in confusion you seem to think I care. Sin. Here is desert. With a whip of my shadow, I toss the snake into the air. Sin quickly unravels from my neck and wraps around the snake. The snake desperately uses the last of its strength but it has no chance against a lethal fold. Within a few seconds Sin is once again wrapped around my neck and I am continuing back to the dorms. I rub my temples as I walk I sure hope that wasn't a student's pet. I guess I need to check the chambers tonight. I know he said he would be back but isn't this a bit soon. I think of how I should deal with Salazar Slytherin one of the most powerful wizards ever as I walk back to the dorms. Later that night when everyone is asleep I sneak away and make my way to the second floor girls bathroom. Just my luck moaning Myrtle is sitting on top of one of the stalls swinging her feet. As I step into the bathroom our eyes lock and I let out a small groan. Before she can speak I put my finger over my lips shhh, speak quietly. Even on her ghastly white face, I can see her blush, ghosts can blush hey. I think to myself as she slowly floats to the floor in front of me. She tilts her head at me why are you here? It's dangerous, there are snakes and an invisible ghost that talks to himself. I clear my throat realizing she was here when I entered the chambers with the horcrux over a month ago. I know that's why I'm here to clear out the scary things for you. I give her a charming smile. I should have kept my shroud up longer. I sigh to myself, I had just completely forgotten this sad little ghost exists. Her face flushes again as she looks away coyly. Well, the snakes are coming from over there. She points at the base of the sink, it is now chipped and a small dark hole is present. 
Be careful. I grab her hand as I give her a smile. This is our secret, okay? I feel myself gag in my head, playing Prince Charming feels wrong. She squeals as she pulls away and passes through the stalls our secret. She mutters to herself as she fades backward out of sight. I roll my eyes as I stand in front of the sink and speak in parcel tongue open. Just like last time the snake engravings move and slither around unlocking the larger latch causing the large sink to move out of the way. I give one last glossé to Myrtle who is floating listlessly in the air before jumping down the hole. I catch myself with my shadow before touching the ground. My eyes widen as the entrance is no longer a disgusting wet cave. Now the nice stone floors from the secret room extend out here and the ceiling looks well carved with pillars supporting it. My eyes narrow as I look at the familiar sealed round door. I slowly approach and speak again in parcel tongue open. To my surprise the door is unmoving so I speak again. Nothing. I move to the backup plan, I cover myself in my shroud and walk into the door. I get halfway through the door before striking a barrier I can feel the pain even through my shroud causing my eyes to widen. If not for my shroud I would have definitely died right there. I quickly back away and shift into my Dementor form. With a shadowy tentacle, I launch it at the door cracking the stone door causing the whole area to shake. My eyes widen as I quickly hide myself turning myself invisible. There is an evil wizard sealing himself in a chamber underneath the school that harbors the most powerful wizard alive, and me. What the fuck do I do about this? Chapter 105, Library Study I stare at the impenetrable barrier with my dead Dementor gaze as my thoughts run wild. After a minute or two, I make up my mind. I will wait. If I leave the entrance open then a girl will probably find it in the morning and report it to the teachers. While Dumbledore is deciding what to do I will research this type of barrier in the library, since only a few students are here Dumbledore will probably just delay the return of students. With my mind made up, I make my way back to the dorms cloaked as to not be seen. I shift back, uncloaking myself in the common room walking the rest of the way back to bed, so it seems like I just went to the bathroom. As I lay down and stare at the back of my eyelids one last thought crosses my mind as I fall asleep. Myrtle won't tattle on me, right? I really don't want to eat that poor girl. The next morning I wake up early and begin to make my way to the library. The library has an extensive number of books covering every category you can think of. Despite having the dark ones locked away there is more than enough to spend all your years here. Madame Pants is already sitting at her desk with a book in front of her skimming the pages with her finger. Her eyes gaze at me for a second before returning to the book. You are aware the library is not yet open Mr. Black, correct? Her voice stops me in my tracks, I slowly turn to her with a smile. I'll be quiet I promise. I plead with puppy eyes. Her eyes meet mine for a second before going back to the book reading is good, but remember, everything in moderation Mr. Black. It is Christmas break, you should be with your friends. She pauses for a moment before sighing I will let you in this once, but do not make a habit of overworking yourself. I nod quickly like a pecking chicken of course, of course. Looking through the sections the rows are seemingly unending, this room obviously has an extension charm on it. No matter how many times I come to the library I always find something new. It's too bad the dark arts section is off limits. Sure I could sneak in but I don't think it's worth the risk. I decide to make my way to the reference section, even if it doesn't have what I need it will still give me an idea. I skim the shelves with my eyes finding a small pocket of books that have barrier in the name. My eyes stop when I read the spine of a book name Barrier Dispersion. I slide the relatively thin book from the shelf and sit at a table. The cover of the small leather reads Barrier Dispersion, by Aed Hayes written in deep almost flowing gold letters. I slowly flip through the first few pages, he clearly lines out what he defines as a barrier and what doesn't constitute. He says he does not consider temporary spells such as Protego as being barriers since although it does form a membrane it doesn't hold for more than a second. What he considers a barrier is protego totalum as it forms a sold membrane around the user to fit their specifications. That must be the shell I saw form around him as we fought. I think to myself as I continue reading. According to Mr. Hayes, the most effective way to break barriers is the bombardment method. Using a large number of physical or magical hits to break the barrier. Basically what I did to the Vila's barrier. I'm unsure if this barrier is stronger than the barrier made by the Vila Queen but I can say for sure it hurt way more to hit it. Besides if I keep smacking it Dumbledore will notice. He goes on to explain why this method is less effective the stronger the barrier is. I skim past until I reach his second method, K Kling the creator of the barrier. This is totally useless since my target is inside the barrier. 
but I make sure to note it for the future. The third method is destroying the weak points in the barrier. If it was set up using magical items or potions, the weak points will be the furthest point from their use. I don't know how this barrier was constructed so this one is also useless. I roll my eyes as I flip to the last page of the small book but as I'm about to close it I see a handwritten portion on the back of the final page. Who is bold enough to write in a Hogwarts library book? I think to myself as I read the words. The final method I know to break through a barrier is one only to be used in desperation. I only write this for those who have no other choice. In a time of absolute desperation, the unforgivable curses are able to punch holes through any barrier no matter how powerful. I write this in hopes that it will aid someone in need someday. Pay heed, the darkness may appear infatuating. As I am about to close the book I notice that the last page can be peeled back. With curiosity, I take the chance and peel it back to reveal another handwritten note. If you ever find yourself confronted by the Protego Diabolica spell, flee at all costs. The words capture my attention but it isn't what I'm looking for. I rub my face as I close the book and push it away erg. This is so annoying. I arch my back leaning back in my chair. I feel the presence of someone nearby, I open my eyes and peer through my fingers. I see the upside down figure of Madame Pants gazing down at me. I nearly fall out of the chair as I sit back up straight and turn around geez you scared me. She gives me a small amused smile Dumbledore has called for an assembly in the Grand Hall all students and teachers must attend. Either check out your book or put it back. My eyes widen a bit it was found already. I give her a nod as I grab the book and stand up all right, thanks, I'll head there now. I quickly put the book back on the shelf as I make my way out of the library. I make sure to stop by the stairs leading to the Gryffindor dormitories before heading into the Grand Hall. Sure enough after waiting a bit the trio is heading down the stairs towards me. Hermione looks a bit annoyed while both Ron and Harry are lazily walking down the stairs with tired faces. Ron yawns as he holds the railing to try not to fall down. I look at Hermione as they near having trouble with the sleeping beauties. She sighs they refuse to get out of bed. I thought I would have to drag them. Harry shrugs I'm not that tired. She gives him a side eye as she gestures at Ron who is still rubbing his eyes. I just give them a smile as I open the doors to the grand hall. The second I step inside I notice the head table is already full of the teachers minus those who left on vacation. My eyes turn to Hermione and Harry who have gone quiet. This atmosphere seems rather... Serious, I whisper to Harry. He gives a small nod as we sit down at a collective table full of Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff, Slytherin, and Gryffindor. Basically all of those that decided to stay over the winter for various reasons. Chapter 106, Chamber is Revealed. As the final students make their way into the Great Hall Dumbledore stands up. He pauses as he scans the room looking into the eyes of each of the students. The Chamber of Secrets has been found. He says curtly watching everyone's expressions. Gasps resound through the Great Hall as the students begin talking. Ron who is on my left peers past me at Harry who is on my right. I told you we should have stopped Draco. Hermione and Harry nod at his words, I only rub my temple. I peer up at Draco down the table, he is excited talking to his two chunky followers, but I can tell, he is nervous. Dumbledore holds out a hand quiet. His words shake the hall, every student falls silent as they stare at him. For your safety you cannot be allowed to stay here. Professor McGonagall and I have taken the liberty to book rooms for each of you at the Hogshead Inn. He gestures to his left Professor Sinister will be supervising your stay. He steps out of the way and gestures for Professor Aurora to take the podium. Thank you, Headmaster. She says as she gives him a nod. Outside there are carriages to take you there. For your safety, we will be leaving together soon. You have three hours to grab what you wish to take and meet in the front courtyard. She glances at Dumbledore who only nods then you are all dismissed. Enjoy your breakfast before we leave. As she finishes her words food magically appears on the table like usual. She turns back and sits in her seat while a few professors leave. I hear Hermione sigh from next to Harry who could possibly have an appetite in this situation. What do you mean? A muffled Ron's voice comes from my left, I turn to see a turkey sausage link hanging from his mouth and another on his fork. My eyes flick back to the silver cloche it already has the top is taken off and a portion of its contents missing. Since when was Ron so quick? I think to myself. I shrug as I look back at the disgusted Hermione you should probably eat, I heard the hog's head has horrid food. Have you ever been there? Harry asks as he begins putting food on his plate. 
My mind wanders to the memories of Sirius, James, Remus, and Peter drinking together at the Hogshead after graduation. Seeing Harry's weird gaze at me spacing out I shrug off the odd feeling. No, I've just heard a lot about it. It's pretty popular among students on winter break after all. I give him a reassuring smile. He just nods I guess that's true. After we finish eating the trio heads back to the dorms to grab their things. I have made it a habit to keep everything in my mokeskin sack as well as my cloak so I don't need anything. I instead head to the front courtyard, just like when we arrived this year there is a line of Thestral drawn carriages. I walk to the closest carriage and hold out my hand to the Thestral curiously staring at me. Its skeletal face sniffs my hand before resting its head on it. With a small smile, I pat the top of its head softly. Shelly seems to like Yadot. Hagrid's voice comes from behind me. I look towards him for a second before going back to petting the Thestral, say, Hagrid, where do you find your animals? I just take care of the animals here in the forest. Thestrals are good-natured and work well as mounts so I keep a few of them. Ya thinking of staring a zoo or something? I laugh a bit, no, I just like animals, that's all. I pause for a second as I remember something so are you joining us in Hogsmeade? He nods I have to, headmaster's orders. Good. The Ministry will probably be brought in on this and they might go after you again. Hagrid sighs you're right about that. I give Shelley one last pat before turning around if you don't mind I'm going to go read while I have quiet time from the other. He smiles course, I'll be in the head carriage with Professor Sinistra if ya need me. I wave as I step in the carriage thanks, CYA later Hagrid. He gives me a small wave before walking towards the front. Stepping inside the carriage I pull out my history book. I want to recap on the history of Salazar Slytherin. Even if it might not be my problem anymore I want to know my enemy. The only thing more impressive about the amount of information on Salazar Slytherin is the lack of information. His feats are impressive and it is expected he was the second strongest among the four original founders. I assume this isn't just speculation and they perhaps dueled at some point. The information doesn't go in depth about why he got kicked out other than the fact it was about a disagreement about Muggleborn wizards. The day and age don't really matter there will always be hate. Whether it be for the color of their skin, their religion, or the circumstances of one's birth. Similar to Sid I guess, I'm sure he was inspired by Salazar to some extent. My thoughts are interrupted by the sound of the carriage door opening. Harry peeks in and smiles upon meeting my eyes. I told you he would be in the last carriage. He says turning to someone behind him. What's that supposed to imply? I think to myself as I scoot to the side to let someone sit next to me. Harry, Hermione, and Ron step into the carriage, Harry is holding a small bag and Hermione has a book in her arms. I tilt my head at Harry who is sitting next to me what's with the bag? You didn't want to leave it in the luggage carriage. A gives a small smirk I know Christmas Eve is tomorrow but I have your Christmas presents in here. I pulled more money out and Hagrid helped me buy them. If you want I can give them to you now or we can wait until tomorrow and have our Christmas at the Hog's Head. Now. Wait. Ron and Hermione say in practical unison. My eyes flick between the two who are now glaring at each other, I hold my hand in front of them so they won't argue. I think we should wait until tomorrow, I also have your presence but I think that would put Hermione in an awkward position since she doesn't have them on her. Hermione nods as Ron groans I'll give you guys the sweaters when we land, my mum gave me one for Hermione this time as well. Chapter 107, Hogs Head Inn. Once we get into town Professor Aurora stands in front of the carriages. Follow me everyone, no wandering around. You can move freely once you have all gotten your rooms situated. She says shepherding the kids towards the main road, not far from the train station. Getting into Hogsmeade we pass various small shops and houses where the villagers live. Stepping in front of the hog's head is surreal, it is exactly as Sirius remembers. The dingy sign still seems to be holding on by a thread with a small chunk of wood missing from the bottom right of it. The building itself isn't awfully poor but it does appear to have not been maintained in quite a while. I can tell by the look on the trio's faces they aren't as thrilled about staying here anymore. It's hard to imagine this is the place that was once used as the headquarters during the Goblin Rebellion. She says with an odd expression examining the rickety door. Feeling the tension among the students Aurora speaks up now kids it is not the cleanest but is the best we could do on short notice. It is not as bad inside. I already know what awaits so I step in first pushing open the door it creaks open revealing a dark, torch-lit room with dirt-covered stone floors. There are wooden tables lining an open in-style main room, with a bar currently hosting three older wizards. From the looks of their glasses, 
they aren't drinking water this early. My eyes narrow immediately as I hold back my distaste for alcoholics and turn around. You were wrong Professor Aurora, it's worse inside. She looks a bit flustered as she scratches her cheek I don't drink so I've never actually been here. The group of students have faces varying from disgust to dismay. Professor, if we put up the capital ourselves, may we stay at the three broomsticks? Draco asks with disgust lingering on his face as he looks inside. The professor looks conflicted but quickly relents looking back inside I suppose that would be fine, but you would need a teacher with you as well. This time Hagrid speaks up to her relief yeah can go with him. I know the hog's head like the back of me hand, I can watch the kids here just fine. He says with a grin. She nods then I will have to thank you Hagrid. If you are staying at the three broomsticks, follow me now. She turns around heading back down the street as Draco and his lackeys follow behind her along with a few of the older students. I shrug at the trio who all look a bit annoyed while Hagrid walks in past me. Morning Aberforth. He says with a hearty smile. For a second I'm completely taken aback by the name. I had completely forgotten that Dumbledore's brother was the owner of this inn. No wonder he was able to get us rooms within a few hours of finding the chamber. Aberforth looks at the students with a rather miffed expression as he steps out from behind the bar. Hagrid, I see you have brought the children. I, I'll be in charge of them. He says with a slightly proud expression. Aberforth meets my eyes for a second before looking away I see. Well follow me, I'll show you to your rooms. With a groan from some of the kids, Ron included, we follow behind him and Hagrid. It's a good thing I learned a cleaning charm from Flitwick at the tournament, I whisper to the trio as I fall back to them. Hermione looks relieved I was about to head to Tomes and Scrolls to find one if you did not know one. She whispers back. I catch Aberforth glancing at us having heard our conversation, I smile at him till he looks back to the stairs. He has us follow him up the stairs stopping once he reaches the top. He gestures to the right this is the lounge, feel free to use it, don't make a mess though. As the person closest to the front, I step forward and peek inside. The room is fairly clean with a few chairs around a table with a couch across from a fireplace. My eyes widen as my eyes move to the painting above the fireplace. Ariana. I unconsciously mutter to myself as I look into the eyes of the young girl in the portrait. I feel a bit odd as the painted girl smiles at me. From my left, I hear the slightly cold voice of Aberforth, how do you know that name? My eyes glance up at him standing close to me where do you think? I say giving him my classic smile. He gives me a befuddled look Albus told you about her. Hagrid speaks up for me young Soren is his favorite student. I give Hagrid a toothy grin second favorite. I give Harry a quick glance before looking back at Aberforth. Aberforth nods he must trust you a great deal. He does not let anyone know his thoughts. He sounds a bit bitter as he speaks of his brother. I shrug he didn't have a choice at the time. Anyway, shall we continue? I can marvel at the portrait later. Aberforth merely continues down the hall gesturing into rooms the girls' rooms are on the end and the boys' rooms are the first four on the left and right. Choose your rooms. Finishing his words he walks away but not before giving me a glance. Each room only had two beds in each, all with off yellow sheets and brown wool blankets. I wouldn't be surprised if the beds were infested by bed bugs. Ron and Harry who both followed me into the first room look disgusted at the sheets. So who is rooming with who? If you two want to stay together I'm fine with one of the older students as a roommate. They look at each other for a second before shrugging I don't mind either way. Harry says, Ron nods in agreement. I'll take the room on the other side of the wall then. Ah, let me clean your room before you unpack. I pull out my wand drawing an S in the air scour jiffy. A light mist springs off the walls, floors, beds and tables covering them. After a few moments, you can see the sheets are now white and the blankets are more of a caramel color. Ron turns to me with white eyes bloody hell, you need to teach me that for when I go home. Mum always nags me for not cleaning my room. I shrug sure if you actually try to learn I don't mind. Me as well. Harry chimes in. Of course, I wave goodbye as I head into my room to unpack some things. Chapter 108, Gaggle of Witches Much to my pleasure, no one else came to claim a bed in my room. Laying on my newly cleaned bed with the smell of lemons in the air. I let out a sigh as I hear someone approaching my door. Knock knock. Sure enough, I hear a knock on my door moments later. Getting up I open the door revealing four girls standing on the other side. The only girl among them I recognize is Hermione who is standing in front of them with a slightly guilty look. 
Could you use the cleaning charm on my room Soren? Hermione asks with a slightly awkward smile. Mine as well. Mine too. The gaggle of girls echoes through the hall making Hermione's cheeks turn red. Sorry, I happened to mention it and they came with, Hermione says no longer meeting my eyes. I give a wry smile as I look between the girls does no one else know how to use scour jiffy. The older girl on the right looks at me with pleading eyes one of the older Ravenclaw boys does, but he is a part of the nasty boys. I give her an odd look you realize I'm a boy as well right? But you're not icky, like the others. The girl next to her challenges, though she quickly looks away as I meet her eyes. I sigh as I step out and close the door behind me fine, lead the way. Not wasting time I clean out the girls' rooms making as little conversation as possible. To be honest none of the older girls were interesting. Walking back to my room I pass by an open door where a girl is wringing out her sheets. Luna Lovegood. I had forgotten she even stayed over break. Seeing her trying to clean the dust off her sheet I knocked on the door. She sets the sheets down before looking up at me ah, Soren, good afternoon. I nod while peering past her at the morning sky indeed. Do you need me to clean your bed for you? I ask since the other girls also requested for me to use the cleaning charm. No. She says curtly as if it should be assumed. I give her a wry smile as I notice she isn't wearing shoes you already know a cleaning charm. I ask a bit confused. No. Again another curt no. I don't feel that she is trying to be rude but her communication sk asterisk lls seem lacking. Then how are you going to get rid of bed bugs and spiders? I ask curiously. She gives me a friendly smile, the nargles will eat them. Dot. Seeing my confusion she continues they like to hide my shoes but they are mischievous, not bad, and they like bugs as food anyway. Then the realization strikes me, this is the girl who believes weird things. I just give a small smile as I nod of course, then I'll just head on, sorry to bother you. She waves to me as I back out the door goodbye Soren. Once I get around the corner I pull out my wand scour jiffy I clean the seams and not visible portions of her bed so she won't notice. With a sigh I continue back to my room and lay down. The Nurkles took her shoes hey. I think to myself with a dry mood. I guess it's only natural that the weird girl is getting bullied hey. My thoughts are interrupted when I notice Harry peeking in my door. He holds up his hands as he opens the door, revealing Ron behind him sorry for barging in, we knocked I swear. I shrug as I lean up it's fine, what's up? We wanted to know if you wanted to go with us through the town? I heard there is a candy shop up the road. He says with a childish smile. I stand up making sure Sin is well wrapped around my neck yet, honey dukes, sure, sounds good. I actually wanted to go get a last minute Christmas present, so it works out well. Do you want to get her my honey as well? Harry nods as Ron sighs yet, but she'll want to stop by the bookstore. I plan to go there to get the gift anyway, I say stepping past them. They follow me to the end of the hall where Hemione is staying with another older girl. When I knock on the door I can hear the girls shuffle around inside. The door opens slowly revealing one of the girls from earlier, she looks familiar but I don't know her. She looks between the three of us before turning around Hermione, the boys are here. She opens the door more relieving Hermione sitting on a clean bed. Yo, I say with a raised hand the two behind me peeking over each shoulder. A small smile shows on Hermione's face as she gets up what do you guys want? We were about to go to the candy shop and stop by the bookstore on the way, wanna come? I ask the two behind me nodding in agreement. She nods as she quickly grabs a satchel and steps past me. I'll be back Ashley. She waves to the older girl as she closes the door. Let's go she walks past us happily. My eyes glance to the other two who also look baffled. We shrug as a collective and follow behind her. Once we get downstairs I see a familiar bird. Shy. I say glancing up at a beam above the bar. Shy scoops down his head as he flies down to me. I let him land on my arm as I take a letter out of his mouth. He lets out a small screech as I pat his head. Who's it from? Ron asks curiously at the letter. I turn the letter to look at the front, it reads Soren Black, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry with neat handwriting. I quickly open it, to my surprise it has only a few words on it. Meet me at Ollivander's in Hogsmeade as soon as possible. Garrick Ollivander. My eyes narrow at the letter it's from Mr. Ollivander. I say questioning my own eyes. What the heck does he want? I wonder. Can you guys go to the candy shop first? I'll meet you at the bookstore. 
I asked the trio who looked curiously at what Mr. Ollivander could want. Sure, be sure to fill us in when you get back, Harry says as we all walk out the front door. I wave goodbye while walking towards the wand shop near the train station. Chapter 109, Meeting with Ollivander My eyes eventually catch sight of the Ollivander's sign above one of the shops. This store is obviously much smaller than the one at Diagon Alley. There is still a large glass window showing off the large shelves of wands, but the shelves are noticeably shorter and don't go as deep. I don't see anyone at the desk but the store is open so I just open the door. Ring ring. The door has a bell on it just like the main store. From the back I see a plain looking man meet my eyes. He looks a bit surprised that someone is in the store. Ah, I'm sorry, I'll be right there. He says as he puts a wand back on a workshop table. As he reaches the counter he gives me a large smile how can I help you? Mr. Ollivander told me to meet him here. I am a bit unsure since I don't see him in the small store. He looks at me skeptically yes, Mr. Black I suppose? He said you'd be coming in the next few days. Follow me, he is waiting upstairs. He opens a short waist high gate for me to get behind the gate. I nod as I follow him through the rows of wands. My attention is drawn to how meticulously the shelves are organized. The length is determined by how high on the shelf they are, shelves are divided by wood. Then from left to right in coulombs is the core type while the rows within the core type determine sturdiness. The person who organized those has way too much time on their hands. I think to myself as I study the shelves. As if hearing my inner monologue, the worker in front of me speaks up I personally take care of this shop, from organizing to taking care of customers. I am Gerald Charmont by the way. He says turning his head so he can see me behind him. I give him a friendly smile I am Soren Black, nice to meet you Gerald. He nods as he opens a door leading to a stairway for me likewise. Just head up, he is waiting in the first room. Thanks. I wave goodbye before making my way up the well-lit stairway. At the top of the stairs is a small lounge area with a few doors leading off of it. In the center of the room is a couch with two armchairs across from it and a short table between. Ollivander is sitting on one of the lounge chairs with a cup of tea in his hands and a newspaper in his hands. I knock on the railing to get his attention. He quickly lowers the paper, he pauses a bit as he pauses in surprise. He stands up recollecting himself sorry, I was a bit surprised you got here so fast. I only sent the letter late last night. Good morning Mr. Black. I give him a kind smile it's no problem Mr. Ollivander. Can we get to the point? I would like to get back to my friends. He gives me an odd look as he gestures to the sofa across from him please, sit. This news may be a bit. Shocking. I follow his offer and sit across from him. He sighs and sits across from me, setting the paper down and taking a sip of tea. It happened two nights ago, the shop at Diagon Alley was the victim of a break-in. He pauses as he meets my eye trying to judge my reaction. I am just thinking about who would have done it, but why would I know? He refills his tea as he continues I managed to catch them in the act since I tend to stay working late into the night. There were three of them, they had tall slender figures with glowing red eyes vampires. I am a bit taken aback by the surprise, vampires are rare in Britain. I have only seen one. That is other than the ones who have targeted me. He nods his head as he sees my surprise that was my reaction when my eyes first saw them. They attacked me, they asked me about you and your wand. My eyes narrow as I notice a set of fang marks on his neck barely covered by the collar of his button-up. Noticing my gaze he covers his neck as a hint of anger crosses his usually jolly face. They tried to make me into a thrall for answers, luckily an aura was near and I was saved before they could get me to drink. I am currently staying here because I have a vampire friend here in Hogsmeade Village. Yesterday I went to see her to ask him about the vampire community. She seemed afraid when I told her what happened, but she told me due to our past. He gets serious as his eyes meet mine. She told me that the King of the Red Sun, a powerful vampire, put a bounty on your head. Any vampire that could take your head would receive lordship. My friend gave me this information under the pretense I would no longer associate with you, but I can't do that to someone who has only shown me goodwill. Not to mention the one who received my family heirloom. I feel my anger rise as he mentions a bounty on my head. A bounty means, even more, will be targeting those around me. At this rate, I may need to start a war. That is why I asked you here today, to warn you. He says with a cautious tone. I nod thank you for telling me, I will be careful in the future. He looks a bit surprised that's it. 
I expected more. Fear. I ask with a flat tone. He nods a bit yes, it sure scared me. I have already fought dark wizards and a troll. I think vampires will be a bit easier. Not to mention I'm at Hogwarts half the year and my sister is an auror. So I think I will be fine. I say with a bit of exhaustion. Then I suppose I will have to wish you luck, I don't think the ministry would be willing to start a war over a bounty. I'm sorry I couldn't be of more help. His voice fades off with a bit of self-loathing. I stand up and straighten sin around my neck then I will be going. Again, thank you for letting me know. He stands to see me out but I just shake my head no need, I remember the way. Heading downstairs I pass by Gerald as he is stocking shelves slowly. We exchange farewells as I pass. I keep my calm as I enter the alley. Boom. My fist meets the stone wall leaving a large dent as shadows leak off my fist. All I want to do is live a peaceful life, why do so many people want to interfere? I lean against the wall as I regain my senses. With a sigh. I make my way to the bookstore to get Luna a last-minute present. Chapter 110, Last-Minute Gift As I make my way to the bookstore I am half-tempted to go to the candy store instead. The meeting with Mr. Ollivander didn't last as long as I expected so they might not even be there yet. Against my expectations, I catch sight of Ron standing outside the bookstore holding a paper bag with a bumblebee in a top hat. Ron, I call from the alley as I step out onto the main street. He holds up his free hand with a smile. As I step closer I can see Hermione in the store window skimming through books. Where's Harry? I ask Ron as I get close. He sighs he went to spin twitches to look around. I click my tongue the sporting store? I hope he doesn't get something, I don't want my present to be obsolete. He looks a bit curious what did you get him? I give him a sly smile you'll see tomorrow. Ron rolls his eyes so what did Ollivander need you for? He just needed to talk about my wand. It was his family treasure after all. I say as I reach for the door handle. He looks a bit surprised as he stops me I can't go inside. I'm a bit surprised but he holds up his honeyduke's bag ah, the candy. Then I'll be quick. He looks disappointed but I ignore it and step inside. An older wizard is standing behind the register area with an account book on the desk in front of himself. He gives me a side eye with a dull gaze. I reply with a smile but he just looks back at the book marking things with his quill. I step up to the desk holding my smile excuse me, where are the books on magical creatures? Without looking up at me he gestures to his left aisle 3, section 2, row 4. Thanks, I say turning around to see Hermione peering past one of the further aisles. Soran. When did you get here? She asks curiously. Just now, I was talking to Ron outside for a second before coming in. She nods in understanding what are you here for? You said a last minute gift right? I shrug as she follows me over to aisle 3. I figured I would get a present for Luna since it seemed like she has been having a hard time. I mean I even got obligatory candy for Katie and that girl. Faye. How kind of you, you remembered my friend's name. Sarcasm leaks from her voice as she rolls her eyes. I smirk as I kneel down to row 4 I try. I skim the shelf with my eyes judging the books by their titles. I see a few interesting names and pull them out. So what did Ollivander want from you? She asks in a similar curious tone as Ron. He just wanted to talk about my wand, I say dismissing the subject. Really? His letter sounded pretty urgent. She asks, thinking too much about it. I give her a smile to say please stop talking. I close the book I'm reading and choose it for Luna's present. It is titled New and Possible Discoveries, The Magic of Magical Creatures, it is quite a lengthy title but it seems like something she would like. You find what you are looking for. I ask while putting the other books away. She shrugs I just wanted to see if they had anything I haven't seen yet, but I guess I expected too much. They do have some newer things but nothing I'm interested in. I nod alright, I'll go pay then. As we approach the counter the old man doesn't even look up from his ledger. Five sickles and thirteen nuts. He says with a tired tone. My eyes narrow at the odd price but pull out six sickles nonetheless. As I reach out my hand to give him the money he pushes sixteen nuts towards me. I quickly take the money to end the awkward interaction and open the door for Hermione. As we step out we are met by Ron and Harry sitting on the side of the street eating candy. Hermione looks at them oddly as I sigh. Guys, it isn't even lunch, I say sitting next to Harry. Ron shrugs as he bites the head off a chocolate frog is there even a time when you can't eat candy. 
he isn't wrong, I think to myself as I look at the half-full bag of candy. Hand me a few of the Bertie Bot's jelly beans. I'm feeling lucky right now. Harry hands me a handful of jelly beans and I pop them in my mouth quickly one by one. Green apple. Cherry. Berry. Chocolate. Marmalade. Bleh that one was awful, it tasted like blood. Ron smirks liver flavor probably, I like those ones. I roll my eyes course you do. Tastes like I'm licking a rusty old pipe. I gag in an exaggerated fashion. Harry laughs as he eats one, his face immediately scrunching. Hermione giggles at his puckered face do we want to head back to the inn. I shrug sure, I don't have anything else I need. You guys ready to go? The other two nod as they pack up their candy. The rest of the day goes well, I enjoy having a day out with my friends. I try to keep my mind off of the other things for now. Once night begins to fall we all go back to our rooms and I start to write a letter to Lucius. To the first servant. Get rid of the bounty on the head of Soren Black and send me all the information you can get on the King of the Red Sun. Start the rumor that those who go after him or his family will meet only death. If this task is impossible, the purge of the vampires will begin. This will be my only letter regarding this topic. The Reaper. I hand the letter over to Shy before opening the window for him. He quickly flies off to the south and I go back to lay in the bed moving my mind to the issue of Salazar Slytherin. It should be fine right? They have Dumbledore, and I'm sure there are Aurors coming to help. A few might die though. That's not my problem right? I think to myself aloud. As I think aloud I hear a knock on the door pulling me out of my head. My eyes narrow as I look at the door, Ron and Harry are asleep and I doubt Hermione is bold enough to come at night. I hear the knock again so I finally get up. Coming. My eyes widen as I open the door to a familiar face says Dora. Chapter 111, Babysitter of the Wizarding World Sis Dora stands in the doorway with a happy smile. Behind her is the small figure of a child hiding behind her cloak barely peeking her head around. Hello, Soren. What are you doing here so late? Wait no, what are you doing here at all? I ask in confusion. She quickly looks around do you mind if we speak inside the room? I nod as I move out of the way letting the two by. Sis is wearing a cloak over her aura robes with her hood up, the child is in a similar dark cloak covering her small face. The glance I get of her face shows she is no older than seven, with dark bags under her eyes and dead fish-like eyes. She obviously hasn't gotten to rest in a while. Sis sighs deeply as she sits on the bed I'm not using and gives me a tired smile. I suppose I should give you an explanation. Arya, please sit. She gives the child a kind smile as she pats the bed beside her. Slowly the child obediently listens sitting next to her with her head down. I look between the two before gesturing for Sis to continue. Do you remember when I was assigned to the dock incident a while back? I get a bit nervous as I nod yet. Well, this child is one of the things the dark wizards were smuggling that night. She was hard to find and almost died. They had her in a sealed container filled with runes and seals while also being held down by chains. She says patting the child's back softly. I put my hand over my face as I begin to think I missed someone. I should have done worse to them, damn it. Although I'm upset I don't miss a beat and my eyes return to sis why was she locked up so tightly. I ask keeping my assumptions in check. Sis sighs again as the child lays her head on Sis's lap, looking at me with the same dead eyes as before. Have you ever heard of obscurials? Sis speaks slowly watching my expression. My eyes widen as I look at the little girl you're not saying she. Before I finish my words Sis nods patting the child's head. Dumbledore requested Shacklebolt's aid in bringing her to him. He will be taking guardianship of this child. The ministry requested my aid to eliminate the dark sorcerer in the dungeons, it turned out to be a good excuse to come. I hesitate a moment. Does the ministry know? Sis looks surprised at my knowledge of the situation no, Shacklebolt had me leave her out of the report. As far as the ministry knows she is still just a missing child that they aren't even looking for. I let out a thankful sigh so what brings you here? She looks a bit nervous as she pulls the child closer can you watch over this child for me? Seeing my odd expression she continues the ministry officials are at Hogwarts right now. I only need you to watch her till tomorrow night, that's when we raid the dungeon. My expression turns a bit serious you are actually taking part in the raid. She nods as she smiles at the child now sleeping on her lap. It is my first combat mission since, the incident. I suppress the rising darkness as I am angered just thinking about the filthy vampires you still have the seeker coin, yes. 
she nods I do. I let out a sigh releasing my pent feelings if you are ever in trouble, you it. I may wish to hide my casting abilities, but your life is far more important. She lifts her head revealing a heartfelt smile of course. She won't use it. It appears my time of hiding may be over. I step forwards hugging her, setting her head on my chest if they so much as put a scratch on your cheek, I will remove every dark wizard from the aisles. I hear Sis Dora laugh a bit as she hugs me with one arm perhaps I should let them hit me, just once. I roll my eyes don't joke about such things. She scoffs why do I feel like sometimes you are the older sibling. I shrug as I release her from the hug taking a step back I just matured early. Of course, so mature, lock fart, really. I genuinely get a good laugh from her words how did you hear about that? A smirk forms on her lips I am well informed. So, can you watch her? It's only for 24 hours. I nod of course. Even if the sky falls I'll keep her safe. Sis softly lays the girl in the bed pulling the covers over her. So dependable. She says as she ruffles the hair on my head. You too Sin. She says patting Sin who is a bit outstretched towards her. I smirk at Sin's purr as she walks to the door thank you, Soren, I have to get to Hogwarts now, I'm late. With a soft smile, I see her out be safe. She waves as she pulls up her hood and steps out I will. I let out a long sigh as I close the door. I stare at the girl in the bed with a pitiful gaze as I sit on my own. It's a good thing I don't have to sleep, I can make sure she is fine through the night. Since there is nothing better to do I spend the night practicing chantless spells. I am mainly training to cast Sectum Semper without a verbal component for its terrifying effectiveness. Not only that but using your wand like a sword is pretty awesome, or as Ron would say, wicked. Throughout the night I have kept track of every single time I practiced the spell. Perhaps it was excessive but time is basically all I have. 6,422 attempts, 408 successes. Each success is a small mark on the wall across from my bed. My mind feels hazy as I've used my magic core to its max. I don't feel like I need to sleep but I desperately need to take a break. I have only stopped because I reached my goal of a 50% success rate. It is far more complex than the simple protego. I know it is a low bar but I feel accomplished that it worked. With this I have a second secret weapon while in human form, the first being able to cast Reducto without a chant. Both are deadly spells but Sectum Sempra is most definitely harder to predict. The next step may be wandless chanting. That being said I don't trust my ability to keep a clear mind without my wand. The darkness seems to use every chance it gets to advance. With my wand, it is a minor annoyance, but without it. I don't wish to think about it. I smile as I see the sun is beginning to show itself through the window. I turn to the child as I hear her begin to stir. She slowly sits up while rubbing her eyes. Her hood is fallen so now I can see her short blonde hair and big brown eyes. I notice her face is a bit dirty as she looks around the room probably looking for my sister. I start to stand up to explain the situation to her but stop as I see a tear fall. She stares blankly at the dirty wood wall in front of her as her eyes well with tears. She softly begins to sob as she curls into a ball. Fuck. I think to myself as I remember I've never cared for a child before. Chapter 112, Kai's Tmei's Morning P2 Seeing the sobbing girl isn't going to stop anytime soon I sit on the bed in front of her. I sigh as I can barely see her eyes past her knees and hair. I brush her hair out of her eyes hey. I try to speak softly. She doesn't respond but she looks up at me. I give the kindest smile I can muster I'm Soren, Nymphadara's little brother, I'll be watching you for the day. She again doesn't speak but her eyes are starting to clear up. I nod internally as I continue after today you'll be staying with Dumbledore. He is a nice grandpa with a long grey beard and a big wizard's hat. I stretch my arms to exaggerate the size. He will take care of you to keep you safe. He see up pair strong so you won't have to worry about bad guys ever again. Seeing that she has stopped crying I smile again tell me if you get hungry or thirsty okay. We will be going downstairs soon to have a fun Christmas morning. I ruffle her hair a bit seeing her nod. As I stand up to walk back to my bed I hear a soft voice come from behind me she said she doesn't like it. I look at her questioningly wondering if I misheard. She looks away quickly as our eyes meet sis tonks, she said she doesn't like her name. I laugh a bit at her words, she sure doesn't, but I have special permission. I kneel down to her level giving her a cheeky grin if you call her big sis Dora, with your cutest voice I'm sure she will let you as well. Heck she would probably be happy to hear it. 
she finally meets my eyes properly with a cute smile, really? She would be happy. Her smile makes me want to hug her how could anyone hurt this little girl? I feel a bit of anger rise in my chest but I don't show it. I nod, of course, anyone would be happy to have a cute little sister like you. She blushes a bit as she lowers her head I don't know how to use a cute voice. I raise my eyes brows sure you don't I'm used to myself as I sit on the bed next to her again. Then why don't I help you practice? She continues to hide her face but nods. After 20 minutes of messing around making different goofy voices, she is beginning to open up to me more. We only stop when we begin to hear people are waking up and walking around outside. I stand up putting out a hand shall we? She pushes the blanket off of her legs as she nods. She slowly takes my hand and stands up. Getting a good look at her now I can tell that she is very dirty. Her small dress is made of okay quality materials, same with the cloak, but they are dirty. My brows furrow as I pull out my wand let's get you cleaned up a little. I draw an S shape with my wand as I twirl her like a princess scour jiffy. Her head barely reaches just above my hip making her a bit small for age, also I'm a bit tall. She giggles as her cloak spirals around her that tickles. I put away my wand seeing she is all clean now. Let's go. I wait for her nod before taking her to the door. As I open it I see Hermione across the hall knocking on Ron and Harry's door. Wake up you dilatory, incompetent, immature, ugh. I hear her angrily grunt as she keeps knocking. Arya gives her an odd look as I speak up having trouble Hermione. I say with an understanding smile. She sighs I swear they are just so, ugh. She turns around and freezes seeing the little girl holding my hand. Arya is the opposite. When their eyes meet she quickly hides behind me. I turn to the side revealing more of Arya causing her to look at me as if I betrayed her Hermione this is Arya, I will be watching her today. Arya, this is Hermione, one of my best friends. Hermione quickly seems to understand her assignment and kneels down with a smile, Hello Arya, I'm Hermione, it's nice to meet you. Arya quickly moves behind my leg again but nods her head to Hermione as a small greeting. Hermione only gives a small smile can we be friends. Hermione asks as she holds out a hand towards Arya. Arya gives a small nod and puts her hand on Hermione's, all without leaving the safety of my leg. I smile as I pat her head isn't that great, making friends already. I see a smile on her face before she quickly hides it under her hood. Hermione is about to speak but the door behind her is flung open, can you please stop bang Ron pauses as he and Arya meet eyes hello. He looks at me then back at the child then back at me am I hallucinating from lack of sleep or that a child hiding behind you? Did you kidnap her? Before I can answer I hear Harry's voice from the room Soren kidnapped someone. I roll my eyes I did not kidnap a child. This is Arya, I will be looking after her today. Be kind, she will be adopted by Dumbledore. Ron and Hermione's eyes widen at my words, even Harry peeks from behind Ron to see who we are talking about. Arya completely hides behind me at this newfound attention one second. Ron says as he quickly runs back into the room. Harry, Hermione, and I exchange odd looks curious about what he is grabbing. Only a few seconds later he emerges again with a small box in his hand, it's a chocolate frog. He smirks as he gets on a knee, Ginny used to love these when she was little. He brings to box close to me where Arya is hiding and opens it. The magic is gone so the frog doesn't move little girl. Arya I correct. Arya, do you want some chocolate? I'll give it to you if you agree to be my friend. Ron says with a grin, he obviously is used to bribing kids with chocolate, poor Ginny. It seems to work as Arya scoots closer, her eyes seemingly glowing at the chocolate. She looks up at Ron and then at me. I give her a reaffirming nod. She smiles as she holds out her hands. Ron happily puts the box in her hands friends. She nods friends. Well friend, you can call me Ron. The one behind me is Harry. I can tell Harry gets a bit awkward being called out. He obviously is not used to children. Neither am I, I was just lucky that this one likes me. Arya pulls back behind me hugging her new gift Arya. She says as she pulls her hood over her face again. I smile while grabbing her hand again so, shall we go do presents now? I ask the now fully awake boys. Harry and Ron nod but are quickly hit by Hermione that's what I came to tell you. The main room is all decorated. There is even a big tree downstairs. I'm a bit surprised but altogether happy then let's go to the main room, the fireplace will be cozy. Ron and Harry quickly grab their gifts and we head towards the main room. Chapter 113, The Gift Exchange Sure enough, 
as Hermione said, there are red felt ribbons hung from wall to wall. A mistletoe hangs in the doorway and a wreath is resting on the mantel below Ariana's portrait. Small bells jingle on the handle as I open the door to the main room more. Small green and red orbs of light freely float around the room and snow is falling gently from the grey clouds on the ceiling. I look down at Arya to see her face is stuck staring in awe. She holds out a small hand to try and catch the snowflakes but they simply fall through. The snow is just an illusion made by an enchantment on the ceiling. If you want to play in the snow we can go outside later. At my voice, she blushes and nods her head while hiding her other hand behind her back. I guide her over to the lounger and have her sit next to me. Hermione follows close behind me while Ron and Harry walk through the door together causing me to grin. Are you not going to kiss? I ask before they get all the way in. They both stop and look at me funny till I point at the top of the door frame. Seeing they are both standing beneath a mistletoe Ron shrinks away from Harry before turning to me. Don't be gross, he turns back to Harry who has now taken quite a few steps back. Ron looks slightly offended but Harry gives him an odd look, sorry Ron. Ron gets even more offended, what's that supposed to mean? You think I'm ugly? Only silence lingers after his words. Finally, Arya breaks the silence giggling at their comedy bit closely followed by my laugh. I turn to Hermione who sat on the couch next to us. Her face is red and her eyes are looking down. Seeing that Hermione isn't comfortable with this sort of talk I change the subject. Are you guys going to get in here or are we opening presents tomorrow? My tone is still joking but I would like to do presents now. Hermione happily nods as the comedy duo sits down while Ron mutters under his breath as if he had been greatly wronged. Ron sits on the couch with Hermione and Harry sits on the large Chesterfield chair. Ron stops his muttering and quickly pulls out the sweaters sorry, I forgot to give them to you guys yesterday. I eye the sweater up and down before looking at Arya. She is currently wearing a short sleeve shirt, jeans and a thin black cloak over top. Arya, how about you wear mine for now? She looks surprised at my words and keeps her head down as she nods. I smile a bit as I kneel in front of her unclipping her cloak and placing it to the side. I roll up the sweater so it is easier to put on. Arms up. She follows my instructions and I pull the sweater down over her. Her face is puckered as her head pops out the head hole, her hair is all over her face. I fix her hair as she brings up her covered hands to her face warm enough. She nods mhm I barely hear her as it's muffled by the thick sweater sleeves. I pat her head as I sit back down next to her. I pull out my mokeskin pouch grinning at the trio, I slowly pull out three boxes, two thin long ones, and one medium-sized cube. I hand the thin ones to Harry and Hermione while I give the cube to Arya. I see Ron's confused look and give him a smile. Arya is gawking at her present on the side. You'll have to go with me to get your present tomorrow, but you have to promise me not to tell your mom about it. His slightly confused look changes to be incredibly confused. I promise. He says questioning himself. I nod, Harry begins to hand out his gifts he gives me a heavy, volleyball-sized box. He gives Hermione a very book-sized present and Ron a box similar size to mine. Hermione gives me a small box, Harry a small, long box, and Ron a slightly large box. Ron is the last to hand out his presents, his presents aren't wrapped so he just hands us them. He gives Harry a book called Flying with the Cannons, Hermione a book called Story of Merlin, and finally, he gives me a book called A Beginner's Guide to Chess. I give a wry smile thanks, Ron. He gives me a smirk and nod to which I roll my eyes. I begin to open my presents as I feel a tug on my sleeve. I look over to see Arya staring at me like an excited puppy. Is this mine? Can I open it? The oversized sweater causes me to smile yup, it's yours. It was supposed to be Ron's but who cares. I plan to get him a wand anyway. She struggles to open it with the long sleeves covering her hands but she eventually gets it. Once she gets the wrapping off she opens the white box underneath revealing a black and white carousel of unicorns. She pulls it out and presses the obvious black button on top. It begins to play a soothing melody as the unicorns begin to rotate around the center. She watches the magic carousel with glowing eyes. I look back at the other to see they are watching her with smiles as well. Before I turn back I feel Arya wrap her arms around me. I look down to see her face pressing against my chest thank you. She says in a muffled voice. I hug her back with a smile you are quite welcome. I look back up at Harry who immediately notices my gaze why don't we open ours as well. He nods as we all open our presents with fervor. I got Hermione an amnethyst necklace charmed with a few uses of protego. 
I got Harry a good pair of gloves for Quidditch, and of course, I will get Ron a new one tomorrow. Hermione got me a small pocket watch, as I open it Hermione speaks up it's a magical pocket watch. Since your muggle wristwatch doesn't work at Hogwarts. I give her a smile thanks, I like it a lot. Harry got me a large crystal ball, noticing my confusion Harry speaks up, when we first met you said you were into divination, remember. As the realization dawns on me I give a thankful smile thanks for remembering. After exchanging formalities under the empty portrait of Ariana I turn to Arya. I point up to the portrait that's a portrait of the sister of the man who will be raising you. She is hiding right now but we can come back when she is feeling less shy. Arya looks at the empty portrait with a curious gaze and nods. I pat her head as I look around at the trio do you guys want to have a snowball fight? A unanimous echo rings through the room as they all stand up. Let's put our stuff away first. I stand up and offer my hand to Arya. She rolls up her sleeve and takes it standing up. I pick up her present for her and she carries the cloak. Let's go. Chapter 114, Mail Order Gifts After playing for a few hours I leave Arya in Hermione's care while I go and check the presents I got from others. Hermione has gotten pretty attached to Arya already so I think it will be fine. Before heading to my room I stop and knock on the door to Luna's room. She opens it without speaking instead stands there smiling at me. She is wearing a baggy red sweater and green pants with a wreath in her hair. I give a kind smile ignoring the wreath Hello Luna, I just came to give you a gift. I pull out the book New and Possible Discoveries, The Magic of Magical Creatures and hand it to her. Her face brightens past its usual smile Thank you, Soren. Here, I have a gift for you as well. She quickly turns and runs to her bag and pulls out a vine. She trots over happily and hands me a crown made of a solid looking vine it's a mistletoe vine. My eyes narrow aren't mistletoes poisonous. She tilts her head as she looks at me oddly just don't eat it silly. I nod ah, yeah, of course. Well, thank you. Seeing she isn't going to speak I say goodbye and move on with my day. Getting back to my room I see a small pile of presents that Shy has dropped off. None of them look particularly large which is good, don't want to work Shy too hard. I walk up the first and begin opening them since I want to get back to everyone quickly. The first is from Auntie and Uncle Ted. They got me a weird quill, and a revealer to pass invisible notes. I assume this was Uncle Ted's idea. A good idea I might add. I got them a vacation to Korea, which is where they currently are. If not I'm sure I would be endlessly harassed by the two-way mirror Auntie got me last year. The next is from Daphne Greengrass, her present is just a small palm-sized box. I got her a ruby pendant with a single use of fiend fire on it, a pretty damn good present if you is me. It was pretty expensive getting an alchemist to help store my spell, even while using the black market inside the small box is a comically small bow. I stare at it oddly at the bow until I see a note on the bottom of the box. Caliergo. I mutter under my breath. At my word the bow magically grows to full size in an instant. I curiously stand up and measure up to it, it perfectly fits my body. I smirk at the present. It's honestly pretty awesome, too bad I have never used a bow. From Uncle Lucius and Aunt Narcissa I got a small dial that looks like a pocket watch. But it is a small instrument called a threat meter. You can only get it on the black market, only the Ministry of Magic officially owns one. It does as it is named, it tells you the current level of danger, green, yellow, and red with three ticks each. As I stare at it goes from green to yellow stopping on the second yellow tick. My brow raises as I look at it an impressive item indeed. What a good servant Lucius Malfoy is. From Theo I got a Verita serum, he attached a knot that said it was his first success and he wanted to share it with me. Coincidentally, I got him a copy of the book that Snape gave me last year. It was really useful for me so I'm sure it will serve him better. From Katie, Dean, Seamus and Neville I got candies. Which is fine since I got them the same. After I have opened all the presents I put away the stuff and head back. I was worried about the bow but it shrunk once again when it left my hands. The rest of the day went by rather quickly, but it was incredibly enjoyable. I tried hard to enjoy myself tonight won't be as delightful. Once the sun has fallen I sit Arya down and kneel to her level. She looks confused but stays still nonetheless. I will have to leave for a while. Before I even finish my words a sad expression crosses her face. Patting her head I take Sin off my neck this is my best friend in the world. His name is Sin he will be taking care of you while I am gone. Sin comes to life in my hands causing her to jump a bit. After her initial shock, 
she leans forward observing the animated piece of cloth with curiosity. Sin waits for her to touch him before latching on to her standing on her arm. Can he talk? She asks curiously. I shake my head no, but he can understand you. Seeing her tilt her head I continue he is so appear strong so no bad men will be able to come near you. But what if the bad men come after you? You don't have to worry, all the bad men are scared of me, I say with a small smirk. Are you strong too? Like a superhero? She asks with glittering eyes. I stand up as I pat her head something like that. I turn to the nightstand and place the carousel on it and wind it up. I originally got this for Ron since it helps people fall asleep and the more important part, for Ron, it silences snoring. I lay her down as sin expands to become a blanket. I'll be back before you wake up. She nods as she snuggles up to Sin who snuggles up to her back. I give her head one last pat before I turn around to the door. As I look back for the final time I speak to Sin through my mind. If anyone enters with bad intentions, or tries to harm Arya, K asterisk LL them. I feel my scar begin to ache as I am standing there. Sis is in trouble. I think to myself. The bottom corner of Sin flaps indicating he understands. Knowing that the child is safe I step out from the room and begin my path to Hogwarts. With my sister's life at stake, I refuse to stay out of this fight. I can feel the Dementor that is supposed to be protecting Sisses outside the Hogwarts barrier. I quickly dismiss it with a thought as I pass it nearing the lake. If any part of my sister is harmed I will not stop at K. Kling Salazar Slytherin. I cover myself in my cloak and step through the wall. With the cold breeze on my face fog begins to leak from my legs as they begin to vanish. I take flight towards the lake where the pipe outlets in my human form, hidden by my fog. As I near the lake I can feel that the barrier protecting Salazar's hideaway has been destroyed. I assume Flitwick managed to find a way to crack it. I hover in front of the grate separating the lake and the Chamber of Secrets. As I look down I notice there is a shadow beneath the dark lake that spans hundreds of meters. It seems to be staring at me as I am not invisible, just shrouded in darkness. I ignore it as I land inside the massive pipe and step towards the iron bars. As my hand touches it I feel that they are enchanted, I won't be able to phase through them. I rub my chin as I weigh my options. The likelihood I will be seen is high so I want to enter through a known path. As I am thinking of blowing it up two massive tentacles reach past me grabbing the iron grate. I inadvertently step back away from the bars. With an awful shearing sound, the tentacles tear a massive hole in the grate. I peer over the edge of the pipe down at the lake below thank you. I give a wave as I speak. With my thanks, the tentacles retreat back into the lake and vanish from view. I sigh as I turn around and step into the back entrance to the Chamber of Secrets. Giant Squid is very strong. Noted. Chapter 115, Back in the Chamber. After the magic grate is broken I can hear the sounds of fighting from inside. I am quite curious how Salazar is holding up against the Aurors. By the sounds that I'm hearing it seems many more than two people are fighting. Once I get within view of the chamber I see an auror laying against the pipe wall. He is bleeding badly, it looks like he will die soon. He has long brown hair flowing past his shoulders and scarlet red robes, a primary auror. His eyes flick to me as he holds up his wand defensively but his eyes widen seeing my face. What are you doing here kid? Get out of here, it's dangerous. I sigh having been discovered so early, not that I care. I wasn't exactly hiding. I may be exposed if I try to protect my sister in secrecy, I'd rather be revealed in my human form than Dementor. I step forward and kneel next to the man who is holding his bleeding stomach. Kid, did you not hear me? Get out of here. I ignore his words lift up your shirt, I need to see the wound. Seeing that I am not leaving he sighs and lifts his shirt showing the skin has been sheared off. I can see his organs are close to spilling out. A normal healing spell is not enough. I need to reverse time on the wound. I grab a potion from my robe and hand it to him drink this it will stop the bleeding. What did this? He grunts as he takes the potion and quickly downs it. Setting down the vial in the water he grunts I got hit by the tail of a basilisk. My eyes narrow there is a basilisk here. He shakes his head no, there are many basilisks here. My eyes narrow as I begin to chant the three verses of Vulnera Sainanter. The aura looks in awe as his wound begins to seemingly vanish. It doesn't take long as I've gotten much better since I saved Lure. Once I finish I let him put his shirt back down the skin will be weak for at least another month, you will need to be careful with your movements. Where is Nymphadora Tonks? He grunts harder as he tries to stand up but fails she was in back with leader Shacklebolt. 
they should be in the main chamber, they never split off into the pipes. I nod as I walk past him towards the main area wait kid, I'm serious, it's too dangerous in there. I give him a kind smile for his concern you don't have to worry about me. Pretend I was never here. After another hundred feet or so I finally reach the exit to the chamber. Inside I see a terrifying sight, stark white corpses stand between Shacklebolt and I, in fur. They litter the area as basilisks, around half the size of the one IK asterisk LLED, are fighting aurors in the pipes and around the chamber. Shacklebolt is fighting back the Inferi, keeping them from Dumbledore and himself. Salazar is standing at the entrance to the mouth of the statue currently fighting Dumbledore. Although the duel is magnificent I don't let it distract me from searching for Sis. I close my eyes searching the souls but it is messy and hard to see. After a few seconds of standing in the pipe mindlessly searching I find her. She is kneeling behind Shacklebolt, I can't see with my eyes because the crowd of Inferi is too thick. I hold up my wand and swipe left to right, the heads of ten disgusting Inferi fall to the floor. The chamber is crowded so no one sees my actions. In fact, no one has acknowledged my existence in the chamber yet. I notice that Inferi are starting to crawl out from the deep water around the edges of the chamber. I point my wand towards the water glacis duo. A blue light strikes the water freezing it and creating frost on the wall touching the water. At this Shacklebolt finally notices me and looks incredibly surprised. The surprise however doesn't seem to last long as he is forced to fire off spells to defend himself and sis. Explosions ring out from my right as Dumbledore and Salazar's duel rages on. Many of the attacks fizzle out before they near Dumbledore probably because he wants to prevent collateral damage. Meanwhile, small explosions land on the Inn Fury in front of me barely denting their numbers. C.O.N.F. Ringo. The red light leaps from my wand hitting just on the other side of where Shacklebolt had hit leaving a path open for me. I quickly run through the path using a protego shield to keep the disgusting rotten hands off of me. Once I reach Shacklebolt I quickly turn around Incendio flame stream from my wand covering the waves of Inferi setting the front most on fire and creates a small wall of flames. But it achieves the goal I wanted stopping the horde in their tracks. Shacklebolt doesn't look too happy at me and Sis won't meet my eyes as she holds a wounded arm. You shouldn't be here. Shacklebolt stresses. I ignore him and look at the wounded Nymphadora you didn't use the coin. She grits her teeth it is under control. I sigh as I calmly set down a potion next to her it will be. I turn to Shacklebolt who looks confused by our talk can you hold off the Inferi longer so I can help Dumbledore. He shakes his head Salazar placed a barrier around them, only a pure blood can enter their radius. Where is the child? I sigh she is safe don't worry. Can you help Dumbledore while I protect my sister? I'm not a damsel in distress. I turn to see Sis has drunk the potion and is now on her feet. I roll my eyes as I smirk at her in that case, we can take care of the Inferi, can you do it? I ask Shacklebolt seriously. Shacklebolt looks between us shaking his head what a crazy family. He sighs turning to the massive duel going on. I can. He says with confidence. I give him a smile and nod as I face the crowd of Inferi separating us from Dumbledore. I will make the path, be quick. Incendio Trio a jet of blue and white flame spray from my wand melting the flesh and bones of the Inferi separating us. Seeing the new opening to Dumbledore, Shacklebolt waves his wand in the air as he runs towards them. A giant snake made of red flames follows behind him as he enters the invisible barrier. The flame serpent swallows Salazar but explodes after a second as a new emerald green flame snake is born from the explosion. I look away from the duel as my ice breaks on the sides and the Inferi in front of us manage to get through my flames. Sis holds up her wand as she bumps me with her shoulder be ready, Soren. I shrug as I cast Reducto. A slash N, normally polls are discord only but I want the lurker's opinions too. The first original novel poll will be a real book that I'm working on, this will be posted on web novel. Just comment a plus one on the option you like. A. Heretical devil monarch, villain protagonist, solo. Will feature domains. Uses ice, void, and chain magic. Uses demonification and perception. Wields a falchion and martial arts. B. Blood of the Ancestors, cast of MCs. Uses null, lightning, and darkness magic. Uses a cure's transformation. Apocalypse, trails in ruined worlds. Wields claws in SK asterisk LLS. Chapter 116, Salazar's Stand. Each spell flung destroys a handful of the seemingly unending Inferi. Although I don't know much about Inferi, I do know that they aren't affected by non-magical attacks. 
This means even if I were to reveal my cloak it wouldn't help much but I am beginning to tire of the endless casting. Fire seems to be the best deterrent I've found so far. I want to use fiend fire but there isn't enough room, and I would be noticed immediately. Casting an enhanced spell is much different than casting the hardest to control curse in common practice. Nymphadora is currently handling the few at my back and in the water, while I am dealing with the front. Keeping them off me is simple, but keeping them off Shacklebolt and Dumbledore are proving to be a massive hindrance. Sis, how well can you cast Fiend Fire? Can you clear them out with it? I ask as my back bumps hers. I hear her click her tongue without hurting you or interfering with the duel. 50-50. I feel like my wand is holding me back. I can hear her teeth gnashing in annoyance. I almost forgot she was a Vila now and a wand was a crutch she did not need. Well they are in a barrier, and I can protect myself, so do it. Then I will keep them from getting out of the water. Sis nods as she raises her wand or to Cygnus a light orange flame sprouts from her wand growing into the form of a dragon as it consumes the inferior in front of her. It quickly comes around roasting the ones in front of me as she turns around. I notice she has an immense concentration on her face as she manipulates the dragon of flames. Once all of the inferi out of the water are dead I place a shield on the both of us and raise my wand high up some glacis. A blinding white light comes from my wand as an eruption of ice spews forth quickly consuming the room. All the stagnant water in the room is frozen solid and the barrier around the duel now has a white sheen like an igloo. The fiend fire dragon has frozen in its roaring posture like an ice sculpture. This was my strongest ice spell, a modified spell, unlike Incendio Laminus Aurora, my first creation, this has terrifying power on an open battlefield. This was only a two-chain spell and yet it is capable of k asteriskling multiple unprepared wizards. Sis gawks at the scene with white eyes, even the pipe entrances have been frozen over. I've never heard of an ice spell that can freeze fiend fire, Sis says looking down at me. I shrug it's just a spell chain I made using glacis as a base and adding an expulsion spell to more efficiently cover an area. She shakes her head as I ignore her and start focusing on the three fighting in front of me. The three I have yet to reach, Kingsley Shacklebolt, a wizard near the peak of the magical limit, Salazar Slytherin, a legendary figure who has surpassed the limits of mortal, and Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, the most powerful wizard of our time and possible most talented to have existed since Merlin. Have yet to reach I of course mean magically, if I were to take on my Dementor form I believe I could take any one of them in a duel, maybe. Green lights fly out from Salazar's wand but none of them are able to touch Dumbledore or Shacklebolt. It is clear that Salazar is slowly being overwhelmed as he is no longer floating in the air pretending to be a god. Salazar raises his wand above his head and an emerald green two-headed basilisk made entirely of flames lunges at the two wizards. Shacklebolt creates a large barrier between him and the enemy while Dumbledore takes another approach. Dumbledore brings his hands waving towards the ice and with a swipe, the ice turns into large spikes shattering the barrier as it stabs at Salazar and blocking the path of the basilisk. The creature of fire turns into a pillar of flames as it strikes the defenses creating a large bank of fog. When it clears Salazar can be seen impaled by the ice with blood dripping out of his mouth and a hole in his stomach. A smile lingers on his face as he lowers his arms and uses the pillar as support to keep his weight from impaling him further. Dumbledore and Shacklebolt don't let down their guard even though he has already dropped his wand. They slowly approach as Salazar pulls himself off the spike and falls to his knees. He coughs blood in his hand as he looks up at the two truly a monster. I did not plan to win here anyway, I confirmed that my spell works, that is all I need. Dumbledore looks unconvinced what were you planning to do with the children? Salazar smirks just no, you are lucky that boy found me when he did. He looks past the two wizards directly at me. All three of the powerful wizards peer at me while I give Dumbledore a wave. The headmaster and senior Auror both look back at Salazar even more unconvinced. Salazar just scoffs at them that child is tricking you, he is not what he seems. My eyes turn serious as I point my wand at him, I can feel it, the darkness in me is telling me to k asterisk lll him now before he speaks. He smiles at my serious face I will see you again. Salazar says directly to me ignoring the wizards in front of him. He wipes the blood from his lips with a grin, as Dumbledore is about to speak Salazar's body crumbles into hundreds of small snakes. They quickly scatter in all directions as fire spews from both Dumbledore's and Shacklebolt's wands, but the snakes seem to fade to nothing a few feet from the fallen robes. Dumbledore narrows his eyes as he steps close to the charred clothes and picks up Salazar's wand. It's just normal wood. He was fighting us with a stick. Shacklebolt's eyes turn serious this is a very serious situation. 
One of the most powerful and revered wizards in history is here and wants to purge all of those with lesser blood? Yes, I would perhaps say more than just serious. Dumbledore says in a calm tone but I feel a hint of worry contained within. Their eyes turn to me and I immediately feel like I've missed my time to leave. You don't think I'm in trouble right? I ask sis who appears more concerned than me. I believe we need to have a conversation, Dumbledore says in a light voice but it easily reaches my ears even though I'm fairly far away. I nod yet, but I think it's best that my presence here tonight isn't known. Dumbledore gives me a complex gaze yes, leave, before others see you. I bow my head a bit thank you, headmaster. I quickly take a long cloak from my mokeskin pouch and wrap it around myself. As I do my shroud surrounds me turning me invisible. An injured aura is in the blocked pipe to your right, I whisper to sis before making my quick departure. Chapter 117, Daughter and Adoptive Father I quietly return to the room making sure not to make too much sound. I smile as I see Arya is still sleeping soundly. I was only gone for around an hour but I was still a bit concerned. I lay on my bed not even covering myself as I rest my eyes. I must be mentally exhausted because I feel myself falling asleep. When I open my eyes again I see Arya kneeling on my bed looking down at me. She has a relieved look on her face as Sin crawls from her grip wrapping himself around my neck. I slowly sit up and rub her head with a smile I see, I overslept hey. I ask looking out the window, the sun is already up so it must be around 8 p.m. With a yawn, I stand up stretching my body, from the corner of my eye I can see Arya mimicking me. I smile as I hold out a hand to her. Do you want to go see the others? Hermione should be awake. Arya appears happy hearing me bring up. She nods as she grabs my hand with both of hers and pulls me towards the door. I smile as I let her guide me out of the room. When she opens the door we are greeted by a blushing Hermione. I smirk knowing she got embarrassed that I brought her up good morning. Hermione nods good morning, Soren, Arya. Arya wraps her arms around Hermione's waist, good morning, she says in her usual quiet voice. Hermione's blush disappears as she hugs the child back, Hagrid said that Dumbledore needs to see you. Arya's ears perk up hearing Dumbledore's name. I sigh as I hear Hermione's words, is Dumbledore here? She nods, he is waiting for you in the main room, last I saw he was talking to Ariana's portrait. I nod, thanks for telling me. I hold out my hand to Arya once again do you want to go meet your new guardian? I see an expectant look in her eyes but she appears hesitant but she still takes my hand. I give another thanks to Hermione before walking to the main room with Arya in tow. Walking in I see Dumbledore sitting on the Chesterfield and the aura I saved on the couch. They both stand up upon us entering, the aura looks happy while Dumbledore is more solemn. Greetings headmaster, I nod my head towards them in greetings. Dumbledore lowers his head a bit as well Soren, this is Abraham Williamson. You saved his life last night, he wanted to come along to thank you. As Dumbledore finishes speaking the aura is already in front of me with an extended hand. Not benign rude I shake it noticing his hair is put up in a ponytail today. Thank you, Soren. Thanks to you I am able to go home and see my wife and son tonight. I have nothing worthy enough to thank you with, but if you ever need my aid just tell me. He speaks seriously as he meets my eyes. I just hold up a hand I didn't save you for some type of reward, I'm glad you are okay. He smirks as he nods, I'm glad to see you are a kind person. He looks back at Dumbledore that is all I had to say, thank you for letting me come along. Dumbledore calmly waves off his words I trust this secret is safe with you. Give Martha and Clark my best wishes. Abraham does a courtesy bow to both of us I will, thank you, Chief Warlock. With those words, he leaves the room giving the hiding Arya a smile as he does. Once he leaves I grab Arya's hand and move out of the way so she and Dumbledore meet eyes I thought you may want to meet your new daughter. Dumbledore's serious face immediately softens as he gives Arya a light smile. You must be Arya. Seeing she isn't responding I put my hand on her back to comfort her. Her eyes look up at me before she takes a step forward. It's nice to meet you, my name is Arya. She says without meeting his eyes. I pretend to be greatly offended as I hold my chest dramatically you weren't this nice to me. She blushes as her cheeks puff that's I was tired yesterday. I give her a smile as I pat her head, I'm just messing with you. Your greeting was good. I look up at Dumbledore right. He looks between us with his soft smile yes, it was quite impressive. Her pale skin turns even redder at our compliments, shall we sit down? I say looking between the two. 
Arya nods her small head while Dumbledore gestures to the love seat and couch, of course. Arya sits next to me on the love seat across from Dumbledore, his beard really is super long. I hear Arya whisper to me causing me to laugh. Dumbledore raises his brow at me I do hope you haven't taught her anything bad. I just smile as I look up at him of course not, it's just an inside joke. Dumbledore gives me an unbelieving look Arya, you will soon be living with me, is there anything you would like to ask me? Arya appears nervous as she has her hands between her knees, umm, where will we be living? Have you seen the castle in the distance while outside? He asks leaning forward a bit. She looks in awe, there. He softly nods, yes, it is a school actually, I am the headmaster there. I must be there all year round so I cannot go to my house often. I have created a room for you next to mine. Arya puts her head back down, I heard that school is scary. Her words cause both Dumbledore and I to laugh a bit. Dumbledore shakes his head, you will not be attending. I will be teaching you personally. She smiles obviously a bit happy at this with a bit of courage she meets Dumbledore's eyes Big Brother Soren said you were so appear strong. Is that true? My heart tightens as she refers to me as Big Brother, she is dangerously cute. Dumbledore's eyes flick to me then back to her, it is true, I could be said to be very powerful, I roll my eyes at his words. Her smile widens, then are you a superhero like Big Brother? Dumbledore looks confused as he looks at me for an explanation, ah, superheroes are a muggle thing. They are people with extraordinary power who dedicate themselves to saving other people. He strokes his beard as he begins to seriously ponder, I don't know if I would be able to take such a glorious title. I put my hand on Arya's back as I whisper in her ear, see? A hero must be humble. She giggles as Dumbledore gives another observant glance as he holds up an arm. In a small burst of flames, Fox appears on his arm. Arya's jaw drops as she looks at the phoenix with wonder. This is Fox, he is my friend and partner. He is a phoenix, a very rare creature known for its healing properties. He will also be the one keeping you company to make sure you are safe. Please, get to know him well. Dumbledore's eyes meet mine and I immediately get the message. I hold out an arm and Fox lands on it, he chirps at me happily as he does, it is good to see you again. I bring Fox closer to Arya as she stares at him with curious eyes, can I pet him? She asks Dumbledore who nods. She smiles as she raises her small hand and brushes his head softly. Fox leans into her hand causing Arya to giggle with joy. Both Dumbledore and I smile at this scene. Why don't you and Fox go play in the hallway while Soren and I speak, Dumbledore says causing me to glance over at him. So that was his plan. The oblivious child nods happily as she hops up. Fox flies off my arm and follows her out leaving Dumbledore and me alone. I give him a small smile you wished to talk about last night. Dumbledore nods I would like you to explain. I am working to keep it a secret so I think an explanation is reasonably warranted. I sigh as I nod, where should I start? The Beginning Chapter 118, Secrets with Dumbledore I sigh as I begin my story from the beginning hey? Then I will start from when I was introduced to magic. He nods as he leans back obviously ready for the story. When I first started staying with Auntie here in Britain I trained in the forest behind our house every day. Even when Sis was not there, I would practice anything I found in books. I came to learn that I was very good at magic, dark magic, and light magic alike. I only ever struggled with transfiguration and alchemy. Besides the dark arts I was most talented in apparition, this will become important later in the story. One night while I was practicing apparition near the North Sea I found this child. I hold Sin who doesn't move. Dumbledore nods, you knew. I ask only a bit surprised as I had my suspicions. I had suspected as much. I won't ask how you got past the license requirement either, he says not showing his thoughts on his face. I nod thankfully as I continue, well I'm sure you know. Lethafolds are able to block spells. With Sin, the Lethafold, at my side, coupled with my talent in magic I felt like I was stronger than most. Then when I first went to school I found most things to be incredibly easy for me, especially with how fun I found learning new things. Although Snape is a suspicious person I think overall he is a good man. That's why I was almost certain that Quirrell was the Dark Wizard. So when I saw him in the woods trying to feast on Lure I saw my opportunity to test my strength. It was quite easy to beat him, which confirmed my estimation that I am far stronger than most adults. During that Christmas, I had given my sister a seeker coin just in case she got into trouble. She was lucky, 
had she not been delirious from blood loss she would never have used the coin. The vampires from her mission in Bulgaria had a powerful leader who managed to injure her. I took a port Kaya to Romania and operat to her. Dumbledore seems incredibly surprised you can apparate that distance. I nod at a cost. I stand up and pull up my pant leg. There on my leg is a large scar leading from the Achilles to the back of my knee. He winces at the sight, how did you survive? I pull down my pant leg as I sit back down you know of Vila yes. He nods I met their queen not far away. The vampires chose that forest to hide because they wanted to capture her. Not they could, she was incredibly powerful. But that is why Sis had a drastic change in appearance. The queen used an ancient ritual to change her into a Vila to save her. Then a few months ago I found out that the soul of Tom Riddle was possessing Ginny Weasley. It was Tom who opened the chamber. I followed him to the chamber one night. I found it was a horcrux that the soul was attached to. I see a realization fall on Dumbledore's face as it grows a bit grim. Tom was using a basilisk to K-LL children, rather unsuccessfully. I K-LLED the basilisk and used its fang to destroy the horcrux. I thought it was over until the mouth of the statue opened revealing an old corpse-like man with twinkling eyes. Salazar Slytherin. Dumbledore infers, I nod confirming his thoughts. I fought him, unlike all my fights before I was being pressed back. If not for sin there is a good chance I would have died that day. But before he could overpower me he noticed you, he grunted calling you a monster then left. I did notice the power of another powerful wizard a few months ago. I thought it was a figment of my imagination, it appears I was not mistaken. He says stroking his beard his twinkling eyes not leaving mine. I put down my head two days ago Sis came to me with Arya saying she would be in the raid. I knew his power so I was concerned. Last night I felt pain from my scar so I knew I had to go. Dumbledore nods his head how did you get into the chamber, Flitwick and Lockhart were guarding the entrance. I smile remembering the weird scene the giant squid in the lake opened the sewer grate for me. Hmm, I'll have to lessen his snacks this month, Dumbledore mumbles. Um, Tom Riddle is Voldemort right? I ask trying to milk more information. Tom Marvolo Riddle, yes. He says slowly. That means I was right he is still alive, I ask for confirmation. It seems that is true, I will have to search for the other Horcrux. Can I help? Dumbledore gives me an odd look why? It will be dangerous. With a nod my gaze turns serious my family would be in great danger if he tried a second rise to power. As I told you before, I will not allow anything to harm my family. Dumbledore sighs have you thought of graduating early? I shake my head I like my friends. Dumbledore finally smiles for the first time since our conversation began I understand. Do you have the destroyed Horcrux? I nod as I reach in my robe and pull out the book with multiple holes in it. I reach in again and pull out two basilisk fangs. Dumbledore's eyes widen a bit that basilisk must have been quite massive. Around 20 meters? You can keep one of the fangs, just in case you find another Horcrux. I hand him the leather diary and a basilisk fang to which he gratefully takes. Thinking of Quirrell and now Lockhart my face turns awkward you do know Lockhart is full of it right? That man can't hurt a fly. Dumbledore laughs a bit at my words yes, quite the rotter. My face turns weirder why is he the defense against the dark arts teacher? He once again strokes his beard he may be a bad teacher but the man himself is a lesson to every student. A show of avarice. The position has a powerful curse on it, so I put a man who would expose himself as a charlatan. Better him than an actually worthy person to make a hash of it. I am forced to hold in a laugh how about you bring in Remus Lupin next year. I heard he has had a hard time getting a job lately. Dumbledore's brows raise is it because of your father that you wish to help him? I nod my head a bit that is kind of you. Do you not fear him? He is a werewolf, after all, they have quite the fearsome reputation. I laugh a bit I don't fear Salazar Slytherin, Voldemort, or a basilisk. A werewolf is nothing. Dumbledore smirks I suppose that is true. His smirk fades a bit I have covered for you, according to the ministry you were not at the chamber that night. I won't take a favor from you in the future but I do require something now. I give him an odd look as he continues you know a clumency correct? A bit, I've never really gotten a chance to use it though, so I'm not the best. He nods at my words now you know some very important secrets, you will need to protect them. Would you be willing to learn further? I am. Dumbledore waves a hand opening the door to the room. Snape is standing in the doorway with his usual drab expression. Outside of me and Voldemort, 
Professor Snape has the best occlumency in Europe. He is also among the best legilimency as well. Snape is my most trusted comrade despite my past, he will help you learn. Think of this as a bonding experience. I nod my head in greetings to Snape who nods back to think this would be the circumstances I would see you again young black. I thought for sure you would turn to the dark wizards. I smile at him as I tilt my head you never were a good judge of character hey. He scoffs at my words as Dumbledore stands and Snape sits in his spot. Dumbledore says one last goodbye to Ariana's portrait even though she isn't there. I will see you some other time Soren. Do not forget to come to visit my daughter. Dumbledore says with a fatherly smile which comes across more like a grandpa. Thank you, Headmaster. Chapter 119, A Lesson on Mental Warfare, I After Dumbledore leaves Snape looks into my eyes curiously, how much do you know about occlumency? I know it is the art of protecting one's mind from others. To keep your memories, emotions and thoughts from being read. It is an ancient art made to combat legilimens from freely running rampant. He nods, that is the base of it yes. How much can you do? I can make a wall, I am also able to tell when people are intruding and force them out. Hmm, creating a wall is often only something a strong wizard can do, it is usually the last resort for poor Eclumens. I shrug, I was never taught after all. Yes, there is no way you would have been. There are a few ways I can teach you, do you have any preference? I seriously gaze into his eyes, the fastest. His brows raise, there is no rush. I usually prefer the most efficient method when doing things. A rare smile graces Snape's face, that is the perfect trait for a potty winner. His smile fades as he continues, it will be painful, are you prepared for that? I have a fairly high pain tolerance, I say with a slight smirk. He stands up and waves his wand causing a nearly translucent membrane to form on the walls of the room. He waves his wand again and the door glows blue as it magically locks. Then we will do as Dumbledore instructed, and use this as a bonding experience. I am not just teaching you to protect yourself but to invade your enemy's mind in case the need arises. We will play a game of hide and seek. I look at him confused as he steps closer you will think of a secret and I will try to invade your mind to find it. If I win we will repeat the game, if you win you will get a chance to pry at my mind. Occlumency is more important so you must be able to beat me for you challenge me. I nod at his words even if it is painful this does sound fun. I think to myself. First let me explain the basic ways to defend yourself. The first and most effective method. Be nothing. Think of nothing, feel nothing, remember nothing. Against the vast majority of legilimens, this will work every time. That being said, it is far harder said than being done. The second method is to push the thoughts you are hiding down. Bring forth any thought to distract the intruder, be it embarrassing, scary, or downright annoying. They will eventually drown in your thoughts and be forced out. However, unless you are like Dumbledore or I these methods will not work. The third and final method, beat them. Use the power of your mind to force them out with your thoughts. I am not speaking of the brute force you have taught yourself. Create a power to force them out use the most terrifying things you can think of. Say if Dark Lord were to try and force his mind into mine to scrape my thoughts. I would send him out with the feeling of impending doom, the feeling of dread. It does not have to be a feeling, it can be a thing, even your own fear. I understand, I say with a sigh as I begin to clear my thoughts. We will need to tie your arms. If not you will flail trying to hit me if you begin to lose yourself in your own mind. I nod, Sin, please. Sin crawls off my neck and wraps around the chair locking me in place. Snape raises a brow, a lethifold. I smirk, his name is Sin. Odd. Now clear your mind, I will begin. Snape's POV. My brow raises as I see his scarf strapping him to the chair. A lethifold. I ask. The child smirks at me cheekily, his name is Sin. I hide my surprise as I continue, odd, I raise my wand to his head. Now clear your mind, I will begin. He doesn't respond, instead, he begins to stare off into space. I notice the life hidden behind his eyes fades. Now I feel true surprise but I hold my words for the results. I begin to intrude his mind and exactly as I had thought nothing. This child is truly talented, there is no chance a lesser legilimens would be able to read him. Good thing I am not a lesser legilimens. I push deeper forcing my way through the nothing with some force I tear a hole through his thoughts. I am quickly flooded by the information he was hiding. 
I retreat back to my mind as to not pry beyond my means. Twelve Grimald Place. What does that mean? The boy who was grimacing in pain just a second ago rubs his chin. It is the location of the secret black family house. I narrow my eyes at the boy you should not use such precious secrets. This is just a game. The boy shakes his head at me, no, this is a bonding experience. Besides you may need it in the future. I roll my eye at the boy's smirk. We will begin again. Try the second method, not giving him the chance to speak I raise my wand again. Once inside his mind, I am barraged by memories of him practicing magic in a forest. They slowly show the progress he made in the nearly six months of practice. As impressive as these feats are I move past them to my objective. I scour deeper and deeper until I reach the center. I quickly leave the mindscape as I stare at the child in unshown awe, UK asterisk LLED him. The vampire leader that day. The panting child smiles at me with a knowing grin, SHHH, he shushes me as he leans back, you know, this hurts more than I thought it would. My thoughts run wild as the boy treats me with a nonchalant attitude. He is dangerous I think to myself as my eyes linger on his scarf. Hey, professor? Can I try a different method? I think I know a way to combine methods 1 and 3, he says with a confident grin. My brows rise in interest, you are free to try it if you would like. I'll put my most precious secret on the line for this one. If you do succeed I'll tell you everything but you can't run away, deal. Curiosity fills me. This sounds like an awful deal. Fine. I accept your terms. The boy nods, then let's try it. As his words fall his gaze once again turns blank. But this time it is different, there is no life behind his eyes, but infinite darkness. My curiosity is once again fired up, I raise my wand for the third time and invade his mind. Inside his mind, I feel nothing, not that there isn't anything there, but it is simply dark. Darkness has reigned over his entire mind, there is nothing up, down, left, right. There is only darkness. I begin my traversal trying to break through the bounds of his mind but to no avail. Good, now try and force me out, I say still focusing on unlocking his secret. The darkness churns as I begin hearing sounds from it, screams. No please stop. Help me. Run away. Monster. The screams set me on edge as I trudge my way to the edge of his mind but I am brought to a halt. I can't move, I am not in control anymore. My vision peers around inside as vague faces appear and disappear around me. They are faces of mummified dead, I quickly look around as I try and move. They are coming closer. I finally manage to back away but as I turn around a 15-foot-tall Dementor stands tall behind me. He moves his face closer as I find myself unable to move again. My projected body is covered in darkness. The beast grabs my shoulders and begins to push me. re a a a a a a a ghastly scream leaves the beast's mouth as I am forced out of Soren's mind. I fall back on the wall as I hold myself up. It is me this time who finds his head throbbing in pain, backlash. I gaze back up at the boy who is grinning ear to ear I did it. He says with an unbelievably proud tone. I grunt as I stand properly that you did, Mr. Black. Soren's POV. Seeing Snape leaned against the wall I feel proudness puffing up in my chest. I did it. Snape grunts that you did, Mr. Black. I smirk as I think to myself if I had known my darkness could be used as a mental defense, I wouldn't have resented it so much. I muse it to myself but I still hate it. Snape moved to the chair across from me as he sits down now you must train the second part of mental warfare. The Attack Chapter 120, A Lesson on Mental Warfare, 2 I stand up as Snape stares with his usual bored gaze have you even attacked a mind? I shake my head well, I have once but that surely doesn't count. I grin thinking about the moody imposter, his name escapes me since he is a nobody. MHM. There are two methods to peer into a mind and five things you can do once inside, the first method is called scheming, as long as you hold no bad intentions to the other person it is virtually impossible for them to detect you. This method is the most common and certainly an incredibly effective tool in everyday life, it is what I will mainly teach you. The second method is called prying where you force your way into the mind as I did with you. This method will get you far more information however the victim will know immediately. It is mainly to be used on those weaker than oneself and on already restrained targets. The first thing you can do once inside is read the victim's thoughts. The second is to feel emotions, the third is to read memories, and finally is destroying the mind. 
but destroying the mind is not commonly utilized since it is more effective to just K-LL them. You said there were five. I asked confused. Snape nods number five is memory manipulation. Manipulating memories requires high levels of charm prowess, it is best left alone. It is also not relevant to what I am teaching you today. I slowly nod in agreement I suppose that's true. Seeing my agreement he continues I will assist you in scheming my mind until you are used to it. Once you have mastered that, you will try prying and I will try to fend you off by only clearing my mind. I nod as I hold up my wand and begin reaching into his mind. As our consciences meet I feel the darkness trying to help me push into as well but I hold it back. I don't close my eyes as I stare at Snape trying to skim his mind without forcing it. What a terrifying talent. I hear the voice ring out in my mind like one of my thoughts but it isn't my voice, it's Snape's. His eyes light up a bit you can hear me. I nod my head trying to keep my focus on scheming his mind. Good, this is scheming. It can only be used to read thoughts and feel emotion. Go ahead, try to feel my emotions. His thoughts ring out in my mind causing, it is not as weird as I thought it would be. It feels like when I get memories from eating souls. I stop trying to hear his thoughts and instead try and feel them. Again I get it first try, I feel an unearthly calmness come over me. I try to feel more and underneath the calmness, I can feel a deep sadness fueled by self-hatred and regret. His eyes narrow at me as I feel his thoughts you are truly too talented, you are feeling far more than I am allowing. I break the connections as I give him an odd look what do you mean? I see a bit of anger on his face don't try to treat me as a fool, boy. I saw that flash of pity cross your eyes. I give a sorry smile sorry, I'm not used to this type of stuff. Snape leans back in the chair, try again. I roll my eyes, he is like a hard to please cat. I again enter his mind trying to skim it, this time I find nothing. I give Snape a really look as I begin to search the top layer of his thoughts. I'm sure to an outsider this would appear off as I am standing a few feet from Snape with my wand aimed at him. We are both staring blankly at each other in silence but in his mind, I frantically searching for his thoughts. After a few minutes of blank staring, I begin to feel a hint of annoyance. Seeing a small smirk appear on Snape's smug face is the last straw. I allow a tiny bit of darkness to help me invade the outer layer of Snape's mind. Instantly I feel the entire of Snape's consciousness covered in my darkness. What just happened? I hear Snape's voice from my head again causing me to smile. Snape's smirk vanishes as he looks serious I see. You've done well. Although that is what he is thinking his face does not look very happy. He puts a hand up and forces me out of his head. This is the fastest I have ever seen anyone pick up legilimency. Acclumency can be learned very quickly since it is strongly dependent on will. But this. You truly are not what you seem to be like Salazar said. I feel the tension in the air rise you heard that. I ask cautiously. He smirks at my caution I was listening to your conversation earlier. Your story was quite impressive, you are a lot like Tom when he was younger. My eyes narrow how would you know? When I was under the Dark Lord I was his closest confidant other than that rat Lucius. He says as a matter of fact, he is neither happy nor angry as he speaks. I give a joking smirk so you admit you weren't under the imperious curse. Snape doesn't seem to find it funny no, it was instead the biggest mistake of my life. Seeing we aren't continuing for now I sit back down. So, what are your thoughts on Voldemort's return? Snape gives me weary eyes it is concerning that I was not the first to be contacted. I will have to question Karkaroff about the situation, he seems to be the Dark Lord's point of contact. I had been suspicious of the increased movement of Dark Wizards this past year. But I would not have expected the revival of the Dark Lord. He pauses for a second before continuing you should also not use his name so recklessly, it is jinxed. I give a cocky smirk I am aware, the only thing saying Voldemort will do for me is get me some free target practice on some snatchers. Snape's brows raise fancy yourself a warlock do you? I tilt my head in surprise that's a good way to put it. I do fancy myself a warlock, how do I get that title? He seems amused by my words any deranged lunatic who likes to fight can call themselves a warlock. But to truly get the title you must be conferred the title by the Wizemgit. It most often gets added onto an order of Merlin first class title. I rub my chin as I lean back in my chair I would get that if I k asterisk lled Voldemort right. Snape scoffs as if they would ever believe the Dark Lord is back. Although, if you manage to take down Salazar Slytherin I'm sure you could get the title. Good idea, I already dueled him once and I wasn't that far behind. 
I give Snape a grin how do you feel about helping me learn how to fight someone near breaking through their limit. Snape sighs as he gives me an odd look that is impossible. I may be powerful, but I am far from breaking through my limit. My brows actually raise in surprise I knew that, but I didn't think you would admit it. My words earn a glare I am getting tired of talking, get back up. We will continue, now try to break through my mind and find my secrets. Thanks for listening. <laughs>